light come on? Yep. Yep, we're good. Okay, it's four o'clock and I'm going to call this meeting to order of Point Edward Village Council on the on Tuesday, June the 27th. Do the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that this land on which we are gathered today is part of the ancestral land of the Chippewa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi peoples, referred to collectively as Nanishnabeg. It is through the connection of Nanishnabeg with the spirit of the land, water, and air that we recognize their unique cultures, traditions, and values. Together as treaty people, we have a shared responsibility to act with respect for the environment that sustains all life protecting the future for those generations to come. Is there anyone with pecuniary interest? Not here. No, not right. here. Okay. So we're moving into the appointment of a new council council member, and I need a motion for bylaw number 25. Please. I'll move that uh, bylaw 25 of 2023 being a bylaw to adopt a council member. And this be approved. Oh, say. You read a first. You read, okay, sorry. You, you read a first, second, and third time and finally passed on this 27th of June, 2023. Seconder? Yeah. Deputy That's why I didn't move it, Councilor okay. Mundy. Okay. <laughs> All in favor? Okay. Okay, so now we're going to do the oath of office for Ariana Noctor and uh I, Arianna Nocter, have been elected or appointed to the Office of Councillor in the Municipality of Village of Point Edward. Do solemnly promise and declare that I will truthful, truly, faithfully, and impartially exercise this office to the best of my knowledge and ability. I have not received and will not receive any payment or reward for promise thereof or the exercise of this office in any corrupt or any improper manner. I will disclose any pecuniary interest, direct or indirect, in accordance with the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to His Majesty King Charles III. And I make this solemn promise and declaration conscientiously, believing it to be true and knowing that it is of the same force and effect as if made under oath. Thank you. Sir. I took a couple. Of Did you? Okay. Thank you. I didn't say that. This bylaw. Yeah, this next bylaw is uh, appointing Councillor Noctor to oh. Fire Committee. Just a housekeeping thing, but. Okay, I need a mover and a seconder, please. Thank you. I'll move the bylaw 27 of 2023 being a bylaw to appoint deputy mayor and council members to committee board positions be read a first, second, and third time and finally pass this 27th day of June 2023. Thank you. All in favor? Okay. Welcome to the board. We're officially here. Yep. Let me start it now early to get through all this. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to move down to um, delegations. And we have a delegation here today um, from Paradigm. They've act they completed an active transportation study on our behalf. And uh, Kevin Jones is here to discuss the study. Just can I have someone um, move to invite Kevin? I'll move it. We invite Kevin. Within the bar. the bar. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Did you get a second? Yeah, I pointed at you. Okay, I was <laughs> yeah. Ariana can jump in, get going. Oh, yeah, you gotta get that monkey off your back. Okay. Your worship, members of council, thank you for inviting me here today to to present to you some opportunities to enhance your village and uh, to support active transportation in the community. Uh, today, I'll give you a brief presentation with a little bit of background and some of the existing conditions uh, assessment we looked at. Then we've got some opportunities identified to enhance Michigan Avenue, Louisa Street, Venetian Boulevard. And then I'll talk a little bit about implementation priorities and costing. And I should note, our, our project did include the St. Clair, uh, uh, Clair Street uh, 
uh, recommendations as well. So we did review that as part of the scope of our work and our recommendations were presented to council in January by uh, MIG Engineering as part of the design project for that. And they've incorporated most of our recommendations into that, into that design project. So I won't go over them again today, uh, just to keep the presentation kind of brief. So in terms of study background, we started this project in September of 2022. Uh, the village was fortunate to get some funding from the Federal Active Transportation Funding Program to facilitate this project and to look for opportunities for practical enhancements to the roadways in the village to improve safety and support active transportation. Well, what is active transportation? It's movement of people and goods primarily by non-motorized forms, human powered transportation. So it could be walking, cycling, rolling, or use of mobility devices. So the village had selected four roads for us to review, uh, Michigan Avenue, Louisa Street, uh, Venetian Boulevard, and St. Clair Street. And that was the scope of our of our engagement. So we did a bunch of traffic counts. We did a bunch of speed counts on some of the uh, roadway corridors. I'm not gonna walk through everything in that table. Suffice to say that um, what, two things we noticed, uh, Venetian Boulevard and St. Clair Street have very high speeds and a high rate of speeding vehicles. And I think we surprised ourselves and, and village staff when, when we saw some of the data that came, came out. And that really informed some of our thinking on, on, the, on the recommendations. Uh, the higher level street activity on Michigan Avenue naturally slows drivers down. There's on-street parking, there's lots of activity, and that's the best form of traffic control or speed control you can have is when you have activity on the street. And it shows with the speed data. Michigan Avenue, the average speed is below the posted speed limit, which is very rare. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the what we call the 85th percentile, that's a very technical term, but what it means is 85% of the drivers are driving at or below that speed. And that's typically in engineering terms, what we refer to as the free flow speed of the street. That's if a driver has their way and they're not worried about the police, that's the speed they feel comfortable driving at. So that kind of gives you a clue and, and trying to control that and lower that is very tough to do. You've got to make the driver want to slow down. Otherwise, most of them will just drive at the speed they feel comfortable with. And we see that on a lot of streets, right? They always uh, tend to exceed speed limits. So that's why we use that easy percentile number to, to understand you know, what the driver's desire is, and that's what we, try, we were trying to change with some of the, our, our measures. The volumes on these streets are very typical for the types of roadways um, that they're that, and the function they're carrying. Uh, they range from you know, 1,000 to 2,000 a day on some of the streets. Um, Louisa Street's a little bit less as, as a local road. So as, as we get into the, each of the corridors, we first look at Michigan Avenue and some of the opportunities. And three big things really jumped out at us from Michigan Avenue was really, there's not a good set of pedestrian crossing opportunities on the street. We think that you know providing more opportunities for pedestrians to cross the street will make it people feel more comfortable using the downtown area and make it safer for them and should help the vibrancy of, of the downtown as well. So we suggest using protected crossings, which are, are PXOs, pedestrian crossovers. They're relatively new in Ontario. The, the, the uh, Ontario government incorporated them into the Highway Traffic Act, and they actually provide a legal crossing. So when someone's at that pedestrian crossing, sorry, uh, drivers do have to stop. And it's a three-point uh, demerit if you don't, and I think it's about a $1,000 fine. So it's a pretty serious charge if you don't stop. So that, that gives us something new, a new tool in the toolbox, so to speak. And they, they, they're starting to pop up um, across Ontario and they're, and they're working. So, it's, and, and that's, so that's, a, that's a key thing. Um, then we thought using curb extensions are a way to do a couple of things for your downtown. They can make pedestrians more visible. So you've got a lot of cars parked there, but when a pedestrian's sitting on the curb, you don't see them because you're seeing the cars and they're back behind the cars. So putting the curb extensions out brings the pedestrian closer to the street. And when they're about to cross, they're more visible. That's, that's number one. They shorten the crossing distances so you don't have to wait for as long a gap to find a safe way to get across. And they can also be used to define your on-street parking zone. So you create those little bump outs and then the parking kind of fits in behind them. And it's an opportunity to put streetscaping in too. If you, if you want to enhance your downtown, you can put street trees or, uh, or planters or anything in, the, in that area as well to help refine your downtown. And then we, we thought uh, improving the intersection and pedestrian crossing treatments at the waterfront park area is another area that we, that we did a focus on. 
So on the first section of Michigan Avenue at St. Clair Street, this is a little sketch that shows the concept of bump outs applied to all four corners of the intersection. Uh, we would put a pedestrian crossover on the west side of the intersection. It's a type C, which actually has a rapid flasher. So the, the pedestrian would activate it with a button. You'd see the, the rapid flashing lights go and, and that signifies to the drivers, you, you have to stop for the pedestrian cross. So as part of that, oh, sorry. You're just the I wonder why you chose the west side because the project we have to redo St. Clair includes redoing that intersection and the recommendation from MIG is to put it on the east side. The east side. There wasn't anything specific about the west side versus the east side. That that's something you could uh, refine. We had chosen the west side, I think, because of uh, the playgrounds on that side mm -hmm. to the north, so we thought that that would be a, a place to direct them to a playground so yeah. they don't cross later. And that, that was the original part. Yeah. But the reason they moved it to the east is because of the fire hall oh, right the there. They wanted east some east separation. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's fair enough. And, and, and like I said, it, it's not, uh, you know, whether it's either side, okay. that's certainly yeah. not, a, not a big challenge. Um, yeah, and so the, the type C pedestrian crossover would be used there. And we would also recommend removing the overhead amber flashing light at the same time. So it doesn't conflict with the, with the science and the science become the focus of, of the driver's attention. Um, putting in enhanced crosswalks. So you'll see some the, the newer style of crosswalks now, they call them ladder crosswalks, thicker white lines. They have the stripes or the, the lines uh, uh, perpendicular through them. They provide a little more enhanced visibility, especially in dark rainy conditions. When you're driving along, you might not see the crosswalk. Uh, so they do stand out a little bit better. And again, construct the curb extensions there. We see this as sort of your gateway into your downtown area. So this, these, uh, these curb extensions can actually define that gateway for you and, and allow you to introduce people into the downtown. The next section we looked at was at Monk Street. Sorry, Kevin, before Sorry. we move on, I just, I just wanted to know, and I think that you've noted it, but there is a plan from the town of Lampton to redo the entrance into Waterfront Park. Yes. Yeah. So that that will change down there. I asked yesterday. They said possibly 2025 for that work, yeah. but it depends on budget. Yeah. So I'll, I'll touch on okay. that. Okay. All right. Thank section. you. Uh, yeah. So Michigan Avenue at Monk Street. Uh, so here we we've suggested again a, a PXO be installed here. This is a type D. It's a little step down version. It's really just the the, the white and black signs, which does does create a a legal crossing, but you don't need the flashing lights at this one. Uh, we, we suggested the flashing lights at the other one because you already have the overhead flasher there, and it's the first one you'll see as you come into the downtown. Uh, this one, I think uh, the, the Type D would be, be suitable here. Uh, enhanced crosswalks again, and putting in the curb extensions uh, at the intersection, again, to shorten the distances, break your, your zones. We also noted that uh, potential for a sidewalk deflection uh, at, the, at the restaurant there on the north side. I know they were using the area as patio space. Your sidewalk does get very narrow at that point, and that's an opportunity if you wanted to look at putting an extension of the, of the sidewalk to create that opportunity for patio encroachment into that area. It, it, a lot of places are doing it now. It does kind of liven up your your downtown a little bit, and but you still want to make sure you've got an accessible width for your sidewalk so people can, can navigate on the sidewalk. So that, that's an opportunity in the right thing as well. Um, the other thing we noticed at Monk Street, uh, it's a very interesting street. <laughs> and, and the first one I've seen quite like that in, in all the work, all the communities I've worked in. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you learn something new every day of the series. Um, but yeah, the, but the, the configuration does create a bit of an offset intersection um, because on the south side it's a little bit wider and your, your lanes are separated by the parking in the middle. So if you're trying to go straight through, it's, it's a little bit offset. It creates a long crossing on the south side for pedestrians. Um, the median parking really isn't ideal for accessibility. Uh, if someone is getting out of a, of a you know, an assisted vehicle, they usually get out on the passenger side and that's in the live traffic. So typically, it's not ideal from an accessibility point of view. And of course, the median restricts access to some of the driveways. You've got to kind of do the, the little U turn to get to the driveway. We did think that, you know, in the longer term, you may want to think of reconfiguring uh, Monk Street to, uh, to be a more standard two lane roadway. You can reclaim some of that space, I think, to enhance the boulevard, still put some on street parking on the street. 
obviously that would probably be something you would do as part of an overall road reconstruction. We didn't cost it for this. We just kind of said, you know, this might be something we want to think about in your longer term. If you are looking at replacing any of the underground utilities in that area, it would be an opportunity to do that. And then down at Livingston Street was the next area we looked at. Again, this, this sort of is the, the other gateway, at the other end of the gateway into your downtown. And, and here you've got a lot of activity uh, with, the, with the waterfront park. Again, there's no pedestrian crossing at that location. You've got a bus stop at that intersection. So there's a bunch of things happening there. And the on-street parking comes right up to the intersection. So me driving through, I actually missed the intersection the first time because I was looking at the parking and I was like, oh, okay, there's the intersection. So one of our ideas is, again, to put the curb extensions in there. Um, any pedestrians that are going to want to cross there will be much more visible because uh, they'll be out like, closer to the street. Put the enhanced crosswalks in, uh, install a, a Type C uh, pedestrian crossover at that intersection as well with the, with the rapid flashing beacons. Again, to draw attention, you'll be coming, especially when you're coming from the waterfront, you're coming from under the bridges, kind of looking around at the waterfront, the rapid flashing beacons will give you that heads up that someone is waiting to cross. So I think it's appropriate to point that location. Uh, we also think that you may want to consider extending the sidewalk to, to the bus stop area to promote an accessible access to the bus stop. But right now you have to kind of walk on the, on the ground to get to the bus stop area. So in the wintertime, it's hard to maintain that area. It, it's certainly not accessible for someone in a wheelchair or, or, or something like that to get to the bus stop. So a short little sidewalk extension would, would certainly help there. And we did note a couple areas where you may want to look at some localized parking restrictions just to increase some visibility from some of the entrances. Some of the parking spaces come right up to the driveways. And if you're trying to pull out, you really can't see that to do that safely. So, and, and maybe by doing the curb extensions, you may look at, you can put a couple of parking bays on Livingston um, to replace some of the parking lost on, on Michigan Avenue. Question, we moved that bus stop a few years back can't remember why it was down closer to the bell. Mm -hmm. I wonder, is that the best place for it? I hadn't even considered that there was no sidewalk there. Yeah. But is that the best spot for the bus stop? Well, or that busy spot? We we didn't look at the transit okay. part of it. Um, it's sort of at the end of your downtown. So just, you know, speak off the top of my head, mm -hmm. you know, a, a stop, sorry, within the downtown may service more people, uh, you know, in terms of, your downtown, you have to walk to the bus stop from mm -hmm. the downtown. It's good to service the park. So I guess depending on what, but there is a bus stop already down by the waterfront park as well. Mm -hmm. So you may not need to oh. serve the park. You may look at moving it closer in town and you and any of those curb extensions could support a, a bus stop there as well. Thank you. So down at the waterfront park, you, you mentioned about the, the intersection realignment. So we've got the plan for that incorporated in here. The, from the county, so we, we did talk to the county about it, and and we, we agree that's a, that's a good fix. It, it will certainly clean up uh, the way that intersection works and make it a lot more uh, logical for drivers. I, I was through there again today, just I was here a little bit early. I drove through and I saw a couple of people hesitate because the intersection is a little different, and you know, that's typically when people make mistakes when they're, when they're unsure. So, this would clean it up and, and make a, a much cleaner, cleaner design. Um, there, there's a few upgrades we think you could do to the existing pedestrian crossing uh, just south of the of the waterfront entrance, putting in the enhanced markings, um, putting in accessible tactile plates at the, at the at the intersection, so someone with sight visibility knows when they're hitting the, the crosswalk. Um, so that those are sort of standards that you would do if you if you make any changes, you, you have to do the accessibility standards. Um, we suggest relocating the bus stop right now. It's up closer to the corner uh, where, the, where the entrance is. And we suggest moving it back to the pedestrian crossing area so that a you know, passenger getting off the bus can use the crossing to get across the road. They don't have to cross in the block. People will not walk out of their way. Uh, they'll walk for an hour at a park, but they won't walk you know, through a block out of their way uh, to go to a crosswalk. So putting the bus stop in the vicinity of that crosswalk might be a good enhancement. And putting a concrete pad, so someone in a, in a, in a wheelchair or a, or a device, a mobility device can have a solid landing when they get off the bus and not on top onto the boulevards. So certainly helps in wintertime. And, um, and really looking at trying to control where the, where the chip trucks 
park. Right. We think that you know you got two crossings in there, and and you know we were tasked with do we need both crossings, and we don't think you do. But I think what happens is because the chip trucks kind of spread themselves out, the people take the path of least resistance, and and then the crosswalk got put in for that reason. So maybe trying to put the chip trucks up to the north end of the parking lot near the crossing, and that focuses all the activity at the designated crossing, and then you don't need the second crossing for the site. That's something you may want to consider. Uh, that would clean up some of the signing and, and kind of weird pavement markings in the area. And uh, and it might make your, your existing crosswalk a little more uh, dominant. Um, so the next section we took looked at was Louisa Street. So we were asked to look at traffic calming on Louisa Street. Um, and typically, you know, traffic calming basically is um, you know, devices or design treatments that are intended to reduce some of the negative effects of traffic behavior, motorist behavior, and trying to return a street back to its intended function. So Louisa Street's a local street. It shouldn't be a raceway. It shouldn't be a cut through. Um, and trying to, to control speeds and, and operating behaviors on Louisa Street was really what we were getting at with traffic calming. There's 11 different categories of traffic calming measures that are typically used throughout different Canadian municipalities. Um, they each have advantages and disadvantages, uh, and, and there's usually unintended consequences sometimes. So you, you really got to carefully look at you know, what is the issue you're trying to deal with? Uh, what's the role of the road? And what type of users are on the road? And what kind of problems are they experiencing? And then try and select a measure that best address the problem. Because sometimes you can create new problems if you do measures that uh, maybe aren't well suited to the problem. So we've identified six different traffic calming opportunities on Louisa Street on, on the next slide. Um, and first one is at the intersection of Helena Street, putting in a curb radius reduction, lining that intersection up at 90 degrees, uh, extending the sidewalk all the way. Right now, the sidewalk kind of ends and, and ends in the parking lot. So if someone's coming along, especially on a mobility device, they're kind of dumped into a sidewalk, and then there's really no direction on where they go. Um, what this will do is we, we had a couple of projects like this, and we put these, these curb radius reductions in. Um, you, you come around that street, and you just fly because it's so easy. You're almost cutting the corner. Making them turn a little tighter is the first way to slow them down, right when they start on the street. Uh, so that, that's one of the, the recommendations we think it, it would be helpful there. It will slow the traffic as they enter. Um, it shortens the crosswalk for people crossing Louisa Street as well, so that's, that's usually a good thing. There's, there's sort of a left turn lane and a, and a right turn lane there. You don't need both of them. The volumes aren't high enough. That's how you get the space to, to do the, the radius reduction, getting rid of the two lanes and creating a long one lane. Um, extend the sidewalk to Light Street. I know that's a little more challenging. There's some property issues there. We haven't really costed that part out because I think a little more design work needs to be done just to make sure where the physical fit is and if there's any utilities in the way, but it's something you may want to think about, especially if there's redevelopment opportunities or you're doing the reconstruction. Again, because without the sidewalk there, you're either you're, you're trying to navigate through a parking lot or you're crossing the street to try and get up to Light Street. So adding that sidewalk would be a will be a decent uh, improvement. I'm putting some enhanced markings, uh, some slow down treatment. So you actually write it right on the pavement, slow down. Um, that can be effective. And it's like a gateway treatment. You know you're coming into a neighborhood when you see that, and it's different from the last couple of feet you just drove on. So it does give you a clue that you know, this, is a, this is a residential neighborhood. And we've suggested a, a lane narrowing treatment, uh, what we've called an urban shoulder treatment. So uh, on the next slide, it kind of depicts that, where we, we narrow the lanes, we actually paint a solid uh, center line because the dash center line suggests you can pass. We don't want to have people passing in the street, right? That, that's not conducive to a local street. So put a solid yellow line, put edge lines down there, and that creates, formalizes your on-street parking, creates a little parking base, but it narrows the lanes. And typically, when your lanes are a little bit narrow and you've got on street parking, it can have a, a, an effect on speeds. The more active the parking is, the better the speed reduction would be, but it certainly is a, is a clue. And the other benefit is if you have cyclists that use the street, that little space can be designated for, for bikes to use too. So it gives them a, a bit of a safe space to use and they're not competing with vehicles. So that, that's one of the benefits of the shoulder treatment. Sorry, I, I'm a little out of sync here, but 
when uh, the last slide when you were talking about you know the left turn right turn yeah we did incorporate some changes into the St. Clair Street project at that corner. Yeah, basically what he just what you said okay. then. Okay. Because yeah. you know, at the last minute we realized we could do a little bit there right. as part of St. Clair Street. And so that is that that's it. That's perfect. Yes. Well, but, yeah, that would be the, the intersection realignment. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I just wanted to note that that is supposed to be happening. So it, is Louisa Street wide enough to have parking lanes on both sides and to and travel lanes? Yes, it is. Uh, you have to reduce your lane widths a bit, but okay. I think on the local street that that's fine. And it, mm -hmm. it's not a, a huge uh, width, um, but it is wide enough for that urban shoulder treatment. You can get a, a vehicle to park in there, and and still navigate. Um, mm -hmm. And that that constraint, uh, to be honest, will actually. I think people slow down a little bit more, but especially when they come together if you got some parking cars. So there is a benefit to, to narrowing, especially on local streets. On, on wider streets, busier streets, you, you don't want to do that much narrowing, but on a local street, it certainly is uh, something that's being done more and more often. Yeah. I have a sorry, sorry, Paul. Council Burgess. One more thing that we could do on the corner of Front Street and Michigan Ave, if I'm traveling north on Front Street, I always have to wait for a red light to turn. It's never green. I have to trigger it. Right. Many cars that are beside me, I live north of Michigan Avenue. They cut down Louisa. If we do this, this will be great. But they're also cutting down Arthur Street because yeah. people live there. They do the same thing. Yeah. While I'm waiting for that 10 seconds for that light to turn, they are always the person who is beside me at Light Street who cuts area in front of me because they're right. trying to race home. Yeah. If we could eliminate that, I've asked before the county said no. Mm -hmm. But if there was once in a while you could hit a green light, then they wouldn't tear down Alexander Street either to cut that corner. Sure. And it's a game. So I don't know if we could address that as one of those issues and bring it up again. Um, we didn't specifically look at that intersection as part of our review. Um, I just know because I live it every day. Yeah. And I see it every day. And people tap and cut through Michigan Ave. They don't stop. Yeah. And it's the same person that was beside you getting the advanced green on Light Street that swings by the bowling alley and races down those two streets. Yeah. Um, but if you do this painting on Louisa Street, you're going to make it less advantageous for them to use it as a cut through. Mm -hmm. We'll need to do it on Arthur as well, because that'll be the next cut through. We, our next slide, actually, you must have been reading my mind. Because <laughs> segue. That's kind of a segue into one of our other opportunities we identified here. And, and I'll, I'll kind of walk through this right now. Um, all three of your streets, Louisa, Arthur, and um, sorry, forgive me, I'm, I'm, this is the last one. They all run north south, Albert, Albert, and they all have the right of way. And all of the side streets have to stop. So you've got a school in the middle, and you've got kids walking to school, and they don't have protected crossings to get across any of those streets. So what we've proposed here is at least force a stop at Charles Street. So do it at Arthur, do it at Louisa, reorient the stop sign. So Charles Street is now the through street, or you could put a four-way stop in, but this would be effective too. And you make all that north-south traffic have to stop at Charles. What that does, and, and you know, I'm, I'm not usually the first one to say use a stop sign to control speeds because they don't tend to work, but what it does do is it gives protective crossing. So, so the kids, when they're walking to school, they get the legal right away at the crosswalk. Right now, they have to wait for a car to yield or they have to find a gap in traffic to cross. So what we thought was, you know, you, you can pick Charles Street or Alexandra, um, but we, we thought Charles Street made, made some sense here. And putting that four stop in may address some of that shortcut issue of people diving down Arthur Street or diving down Louisa Street to, to do that shortcut with uh, changing the right of way control. And that would be relatively cheap to do uh, as part of part of the uh, measures. And uh, the next area we looked at was Venetian Boulevard. We were asked to look at the site uh, feasibility review on, on Venetian Boulevard. And, and first question is, well, why are we looking for site facilities on, on the county road? Well, it's part of the county trail system. Uh, it's designated in, in their trail map. It connects the waterfront park to all the trail to the south um, when, you, when you get into Sarnia. Already being used by cyclists. The day we were out here, we saw two cyclists on the road, and that was in November when we did our first field review. So 
So it is being used. I saw some more cyclists out there today when I was when I was driving through uh, this afternoon. So there, there's some justification to say, okay, what type of facility could we could we look at? So on the next slide, um, so there's a technical process we use to go through and assess what are appropriate. Uh, Ontario Traffic Manual Book 18 gives us a standard for how do you evaluate what type of cycling facility is best suited. Um, based on the volumes and speeds on, on Venetian Boulevard, it would suggest that a separate cycling lane or a physically separated facility would be, would be required on this type of roadway. Your speeds are very high on Venetian Boulevard. And uh, and your volumes aren't super high, but it's, it's the speeds that are that are really the, the issue here. And when you look at the type of users connecting parks and trail systems, we like to, to promote uh, a facility that is suitable for all ages and abilities in that type of situation. And really what that means is you know, users feel safe, users feel comfortable, it's a low stress riding environment, and it's equitable to all types of users, regardless of their abilities or skills or, or experience. So that's where you get the higher levels of protection are more suitable for all ages and, and abilities. So you have kids and families and things like that. Right? So we, went, we on the next slide, we went through an assessment of different types of cycling facilities that would be appropriate. We looked at standard, just mark a bike lane. Uh, we looked at what they call a buffered bike lane, which is basically an on-street lane with a bit of a buffer treatment in between the vehicles and, and the bikes to, to provide a little more protection. We looked at a multi-use path on either the, either the east or the west side. We looked at two-way raised cycle tracks, which are cycling-only facilities, and then a one-way raised cycle track in each direction. And, and really, there's two options that, that stood out to us, the buffered bike lane and the multi-use path on the east side. Now, as we did our evaluation, we looked at cost, um, potential need to reconstruct the roadway. We're trying to do this sort of with a minimal amount of reconstruction. Uh, impacts on the hydro pole line on the uh, east side of the roadway. It's a very big hydro pole line, high voltage lines. You don't really want to be relocating those poles. Um, and safety and then maintenance considerations too, because sometimes with certain types of facilities, it's extra maintenance work to keep them clear all year round or, or uh, especially in the winter time. So the protected buffered on-street bike lane or multi-use path will be the most appropriate for, for this location. And you could do the buffered protected bike lane as an interim measure uh, without the need for significant construction um, while you're maybe looking toward implementing a multi use path, which is sort of the ultimate, I think, mean, facility you'd want it in that type of environment, but the buffered bike lane could work in the interim. Yeah. The next slide shows sort of a concept design of what that would look like uh, as an interim solution. You would have painted bike lanes on either side of the road, shown in the green. Uh, you have a buffer treatment. It's usually done with paint, um, but you would also be, when we say protected, so you'd need to put something in there based on the standards to give a little bit more protection for cyclists. So you could use uh, flexible uh, ballers, delineator posts, um, or you could use concrete curbs or, or other types of, of measures like that to give that physical separation. I've got a couple photos there in Toronto they use. Mm -hmm. Con concrete curb treatments. Uh, they've lasted very well. They left them in over the winter. They were able to maintain them over the winter. Uh, so there's a couple options there, or you could even remove them in the winter time if you know if you didn't want to, because they do create some extra maintenance uh, considerations. And then there's a few supporting measures that we we also suggested as well. So the intersection at the casino driveway is a little unique in the way it's oriented. The volumes are almost more suited for the straight through movement along Venetian Boulevard, but there's a fair number of people coming in there at the casino as well. But if you're going with on-street bike lanes, you really want to now give the right of way for the on-street cyclists, because uh, they're going to have difficulty navigating through that configuration of the intersection. So we're suggesting realigning that to sort of a 90 degree intersection taking out that little island treatment and making Venetian Boulevard the through road and the casino driveway has to stop like a normal driveway would. And that allows the bike lanes to continue on street. They don't have to sort of stop and, and make the, the, the left turn um, to, to continue straight through. So that would be a good supporting measure there. Um, and uh, also at the Highway 402 ramps, usually when you have merging on ramps, on street bike lanes can be a little bit tricky because you know, the merging traffic 
you might not see the bike coming up beside them. So what we tend to use in those situations is the green paint, that's sort of like a conflict area, uh, painting treatment, and that just warns everyone that, hey, there might be a conflict, take a little more care. And we would recommend that would be implemented in the, in the interim. On the ultimate uh, solution, a multi-use pass on, on the east side, uh, you could put it either inside the hydro poles or outside the hydro poles. There's enough width out there, we think you can fit it inside the hydro poles and make your lanes a little bit narrower, narrower on Venetian Boulevard. That should actually control speeds a little bit as well. And you can put it in with only reconstruction of sort of one side of the street, like the curbs on the, on the east side, and then putting in the multi-use path. But that's going to be a, a much more extensive um, initiative. The other thing, uh, one of the supporting measures as a potential there is to convert that intersection to a roundabout at the casino driveway. Um, it, it's an ideal situation. We, we've kind of laid out a 36 meter radius there, which is kind of as tight as you'd want to go for this type of facility. There would be some extra property required. So we, we've said, you know, this is probably a longer term initiative, but might, might be one you want to keep in the back of your mind if development comes through in that area and then maybe you can combine it with some development and and, and do some property uh, negotiations to secure the land to do that. And that would actually be a nice measure to help control the speeds on the Lucian ORR as well, because roundabouts do tend to slow people down as they come into them and, and go out. And then you would have a multi-use path crossing at the Howard 402 ramp, which is pretty standard now. There's special pavement parking treatments you can use for that. And that would be a good supporting measure. Just a question on that. Is the county I know is already looked at Venetian for possible cycling lanes. So can we make sure they get this information? Yeah, they've already we been involved. They've got it already. Yeah, okay. Good. Yeah, we, we work yeah. with the county as, as part, right. of, uh, part of this project and bounce all of our sort of ideas and recommendations off. Okay. So I'm, I'm the village rep on the Clinton County Trail Strain. Okay. So we, you know, we're all in, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Perfect. So in terms of costs and phasing, uh, for Michigan Avenue, you could do it at any pace you really want. We've suggested you could do it in four phases, just to, to spread the spread the costs out over a few years. Uh, starting with the St. Clair intersection, we figure that's about $165,000 worth of work. It might be a little cheaper if you combine it with the work you're already doing on St. Clair, so I know you're, you're already working on that. Uh, so those costs will likely be a little bit cheaper because the more the bigger your quantities, the lower the, the prices tend to be. Uh, Livingston Street intersection would be our next suggested uh, initiative. And that should be around 137,000 plus or minus in terms of costs. The waterfront park area, uh, about 189,000, assuming we don't have to relocate any utilities and, and things like that. That was kind of based on the cost estimate for the county work. And then we've added in some of the extra measures that we, we've suggested as well and factored up for inflation as well. And Monk Street intersection, uh, about 165,000 for the initial treatments. That's not the reconfiguration that we kind of planted the seed for. That, uh, that's a, a bigger project, but uh, so in, in total, just under 700,000. Uh, and you can do that sort of respecting your own sort of budget constraints and, uh, and, uh, yeah, and, and phasing how you, how you can afford to. For Louisa Street, um, on the next slide, we're estimating about 125,000 for that work. Uh, again, if you're incorporating the Helena Street intersection into the, into the St. Clair project, perfect. That might be a little cheaper than the 95,000 we've suggested. Uh, for the urban shoulder and right away changes, it's about 30,000 for some line marking and, and signing and, and markings. It should be a relatively a modest amount. Um, and you can do it as one contract or break it up into the stages. Venetian Boulevard is the big ticket. Even doing the, uh, the on-street bike lanes with the level of protection uh, there, it's about $850,000, our estimate to do that. Uh, it's a long stretch of road, but almost two kilometers long. Just the paint alone is, is fairly expensive to, to do that, that work. Doing your multi-use path, we're estimating about on 1.5 million, as long as you can not have to touch any of the hydro poles. Um, and a little more uh, design work needs to be done to refine that number, but that's sort of based on sort of other projects we've seen where they've constructed new multi-use paths and comes in around, around that price. Um, the roundabout cost concept isn't included in that. That requires some property and more engineering design work to, to finalize the cost. But it was something there we thought was 
maybe something you want to keep in the back of your mind for, for future considerations. So with that, that concludes my presentation. Uh, if there's any other questions you have, I'd be so happy to entertain them. I'll start at the end. Councilman Mondo, do you have anything? Ah, uh, yes, I do. Through the chair, uh, Michigan Ave. I, I told you earlier, I'm a resident, right? It's it's commercial and institutional, recreational, along that that stretch. And I'm just wondering, will these Crossovers help too. I know speed from the, from the stats, the speed isn't high, but when you live there, you think the speed's high, or it is high. Will that help reduce speed? Because we've got some speeds that, you know, because it's just one straight run all the way down the front street. You know what I'm saying? With these pedestrian crossings, do you think that will help reduce speed? Absolutely. Because it's visual? Uh, absolutely. I, I think the, the curve extensions uh, we found are, are really. Because they constrain the pavement and and you can put streetscaping in those things, you bring your poles out, that actually is very effective. And, and, and it's interesting, I don't know if you've been down to Bell River, uh, they did, uh, that's another project we are working on, but they did that treatment in, on their, it's a county road, it comes right through Bell River uh, in, in Lakeshore. You have a picture on your... I, website? I don't have it on my website. I thought I saw something about maybe. Oh, I did. I did in the presentation. Yeah. The, one of the curve extensions yeah. was from Bell River. Bell River. Okay. And that has lowered the speeds. Okay. Significant. And, and it looks nice. And it actually, you know, you're driving through it, it, it does naturally, it creates what I call friction, uh, side friction. That's what I find is the best thing to control speeds. The more, I hate to say, the more nervous someone feels when they're driving, the slower they're going to drive. So if, if you're constraining them a bit, you've got your parking, but you've got those curb extensions, they feel a little narrow, it looks a little narrower, they tend to slow down. I, that is what I think is going to slow people even further in Michigan Avenue. You put those two intersection treatments at either end, and I think you'll see the speeds reduce. Uh, my next question is, would a speed reduction for that area be beneficial? It's 50 now, most downtowns aren't 50. Yeah. Move to 40, possibly a community safety zone because of, there's lots of activity there through the day, right? So I'm just thinking, you know, in your opinion, would that be something that we, we should be looking at? I would tend to do the treatments first. Mm -hmm. um, they would be more effective than just lowering the speed yeah. arbitrarily. Um, but certainly, you know, if you do the treatments, you could actually lower the speed afterwards if you see that people start to respond, and then you put the speed down to that lower limit, and it again creates that that positive feedback. Mm -hmm. um, but doing it too soon, I think, would be counterproductive. Um, the speeds aren't too bad right now. I would make I would make the investments in the, in the treatments first. Okay. And one more question: Should the speed limit on all our local and collector roads be reduced based on? What you've seen in other communities. I think a lot of other communities now are, are moving yeah. away from 50 down to 40. Yeah. Um, we are getting that question more and more on projects. Uh, it was interesting. It, it's a bit of a new area speed limits. It's something new that was introduced in the Highway Traffic Act. Uh, I did see a presentation from the city of Mississauga. So they went and did all of their local streets at 40K. And the school zones were 30K. And after a year, they found basically no change in speeds. But they didn't do anything else. They did not amp up enforcement. They didn't they didn't do any other measures to control speeds. They they just did the, the reduced speeds and they found it didn't do much after the first year. Now I think you know they're moving into automated enforcement with the, with the photo radar cameras, especially in the fuel zones where you're in community safety zones where, where they're permitted. So I think that was their ultimate Plan. So eventually they'll get those deployed and then, you know, that might have a better effect on speeds, but just doing the signing the around process didn't do, didn't do much. Okay. Okay. Great. 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 Thank you. No questions for me at this time. Um, you know, there's a lot there and I've gone over it a couple of times and the challenges for us, of course, are two of the roads aren't ours. Yeah. So we have to work with the county on Michigan and Venetian. But I personally, I'd be excited. Louisa would be something that we could, we're going to have to make priorities and shoot things out. 
and I would say Louisa is something we could maybe tackle next year or next budget. But anyway, it's, there's a lot of information here and a lot that we can do with it. It's going to take a lot of money yes. and time to figure out which steps go first. Yeah, and that's why we did suggest a bit of a phasing program. Yeah, and recognized. that's great because it's, yeah, it's it's in chunks. Yeah, it's chunks, and we tried to suggest where we thought the best investment would be earlier, um, but again, in small chunks, so you you can fit it into your budget as you as you can afford. I don't know. I mean, the active transportation fund they've closed the intakes for now. Um, not to say they're not going to reopen. So keep an eye open for that. Yeah. If they do reopen, you can apply to actually implement some of these now that you've done the study and you, know, yeah, you might, uh, might, I know for First Nations, they're still allowed to make applications. So the hope is that they're gonna keep the fund open um, or have another intake for for other municipal partners to try and secure funding. So I would suggest you keep your eyes open that yeah. Yeah, the source of some funding. I wrote that down too as, as, as a consideration that we could work with the county if an opportunity came up that we could do a joint a joint term grant application, perhaps. So um, we'll keep an eye open. Okay, you next. Sir. Yes, thank you. Um, have you gone up St. Clair Street where we've installed our bollards and line painting to I, create that? I did see that today, actually. Okay. I went on there today just to kind of refresh myself again, and then we saw the, the new bollard treatments. So it wouldn't yeah. have been up in November. Yeah. Yeah, so we 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 put that up last season, last summer, and this summer. So we we found that it's had good um, success. We think, um, and if it might bring those speeds down that you mentioned on Saint Clair Street uh, during that time of the year, um, and we've had good success with the line painting out, and it makes the Louisa Street solution was right in front of our faces, and we've done it other yeah. other places, and it worked. And I don't know why we didn't think of that ourselves, but. Um, it's nice that you've validated that approach uh, for us as well, and I found the pricing not too uh, out of line. Uh, I think I think for this, the changes these will bring to the community as far as traffic calming and safety. I think the prices are not that uh, out of line for for what we need to do. So I thank you for the presentation, very detailed, and and the different phases are really help us prioritize and move forward. As an expert in this field. What's your opinion on photo radar for municipalities? Well, um, it could be a very powerful tool. It's not inexpensive. Um, it's and right now there's a bit of a logjam, I guess, in the photo radar because the processing of the fines all happens in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And it's all done through the city of Toronto. So you have to enter into a contract with the city to do the processing of the infractions because they have to do it through their vendor. Now, I, I think some of the municipalities are starting to get together to see if they can create a new processing center that isn't um, in Toronto. I, I heard through AMO that, that that's something that's going on. Um, that might reduce some of the cost because that costs. Like you have to pay them to do all the photo processing and, and issuing the infractions. Uh, the other thing a lot of municipalities um, were worried about was the court time because with the number of charges and people trying to fight, your local prosecution could get swamped with challenges. So the, a lot of municipalities have asked the province to allow for administrative monetary penalties uh, to go along for these types of charges. So you're not using up a lot of court time and court resources to, to, to defend these, these tickets. Uh, so that's something I think is in the works as well. Um, and that makes, uh, those are all pieces I think that other municipalities have started on the process, say, you know, these are things that would help. Typically in, in higher volume locations, the revenue from fines will typically pay for the cameras over a couple of years, uh, but they are not inexpensive. And you can only go through one vendor because they all have to be certified that, you know, they're, they meet the standards and they can't be challenged. Uh, through the court process. So we've kind of said for smaller clients, like smaller municipality clients of ours, that maybe let let the bigger companies kind of, or the bigger municipalities work out some of the issues and, and 
the economies of scale will start to bring the prices down, and then it might be more effective for you to get into them. And those, because right now, I think you almost have to secure a, a certain number of cameras as well before you could actually get in on the on the, the contract. So that starts to create a pretty big cost to start the program. So, but they can be effective. Now, the other side of the same, if they are very effective, you'll get zero revenue. <laughs> like if everyone starts, <laughs> you know, obeying the speed limit, you'll have zero revenue with the big cost of the camera. Yeah. But what, what we've also seen is a few municipalities have um, started using, you know, buying the minimum amount and using them at roving locations. So rotating them around. So you're not, you know, everyone knows where it is. They slow down right there and then they speed up as they get past. So you move them to different locations. They can only go in school zones or community safety zones. Mm -hmm. So you would have to strategically think, okay, where would we apply those? And then you could buy a few devices and move them around. You have to do the signing. They have to be signed in advance to warn people that the, the photo radar is there. But there is, and I think Durham Region is now testing that idea out, uh, moving them to different little hotspots. Um, that's a, that's a way to also maybe make them a little more effective and, and maybe try and address a few issues all at once, a few problem areas, instead of just you know, buying two or three cameras and then you're only addressing two or three locations where you're spending a couple hundred thousand dollars to buy them. Not cheap. Okay. Thanks for addressing the yeah. Just uh, If I could a follow up on that. Um, when I was at AMO last year, there were a couple vendors who will provide you with the speed cameras and they just take a percentage of the tickets and you don't have any upfront capital or hardware costs and they manage the entire program. But we never discussed what their percentage was, but I assume that would be. I don't, I'm not aware that that is reportable through the court process. Okay. So yeah, I'd have to do a little more research okay. on that because I my understanding is there's one vendor that has got the equipment that's been certified right. and the court processing happens at the joint processing center and that's where the charges are issued because they're right now they're provincial offenses right so they, they have to be certified so um now there's a revenue that goes to the vendors of the devices but uh, i don't know if any other vendors right. are able to do that in the area right now okay. that's like more research okay on. thank you Jim, did you have one? Um, just a little bit on St. Clair Street. So um, one of the recommendations, a couple of main recommendations that uh, come out of the Paradigm Report was four-way stop at St. Clair and Alexandra. Yeah. So that's being implemented into the plan. And then uh, you might be able to help me with the type of crosswalk, but a crosswalk on the north side of Alexandra at St. Clair. A marked like a, a ladder type yeah. crosswalk, I, no yeah. flashing lights. No flashing light. And with a four way stop, you don't need the PXO because uh, the four way stop does give the pedestrian the right away. And that's actually usually I'm not one to suggest a four way stop as a sort of a traffic control measure unless the warrants are there. But in this case, because of the pedestrian crossing and the, the visibility coming around the curve, uh, that's what kind of tilted it for us. So yeah, we think a four-way stop is the best solution there. It does give a legal protected crossing for the kids that are going to school the other way. Um, and it's, it's it's less risk. And now, you, you know, the curve is still a problem coming uh, coming northbound. So we suggested putting in a, a sort of a stop ahead uh, sign in advance to give some warning that you're going to come around the curve and hit a stop sign. Uh, the other thing you could do is you could put stop signs on both sides of the road. So the one on the far side of the road is visible first as you're coming around the curve. So that's uh, some of these colleagues have done that in areas where there's a curve. But when you weigh the risks, you know, I'd rather have someone have to jam on the brakes because they didn't see the stop sign rather than a kid step off the curb and, and someone didn't see them. So that, that's that's where we thought uh, putting the four-way stop was the right solution. And then also it would include the the curb out to the bump out to whatever yes. to shorten up the crossing distance for pedestrians. So mm -hmm. just wanted to point out that's part of the design for St. Clair Street. And then also uh, Paradigm's recommendation was to put kind of mid block on St. Clair somewhere in the middle, a crosswalk. And council show council their wishes were to put it at an intersection. And I mean we had considerable considerable debate about that matter. And so just again, to be clear that that's what's in the plan now is to put 
bump outs and uh, and a ladder crosswalk, no lights at Albert Street. Albert, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, Albert so, so that uh, mm -hmm. council's aware that's yeah. what the plan mm -hmm. is for St. Clair Street. Okay. And if I may just ask, are, are, are you okay with? The change the council did because the mid block the feedback we got was nobody wanted in front of the house near not in my front yard right and we thought that was a good compromise in that corner if you're familiar with it there is a lot of green space on the one property so we didn't think it was going to be too uh yeah i mean it was something we suggested as a as a spent, mm -hmm. primarily because you're putting a multi-use trail on the other side of the street so people are going to want to cross to get the trail and without a protected crossing somewhere in that block then we thought so that would give a, a, a protected crossing further to the south. And then you have the four-way stop at Alexander. So you'd have two sort of protected crossings at either end, and that would just enhance access to the trail. That was really what was promoting us to, to, to uh, suggest that. And working in uh, a little bump out treatment at the crosswalk, again, it, it's one of those narrowing treatments. So given the speeds out there, we thought that might be a nice as you're coming around the curve, you just nicely get into the straightaway. When you're starting to speed up, you have that little uh, curve extension that just makes you feel a little more constrained and, and slow down. So that was some of the reason why we had suggested it, but uh, you know, certainly uh, you know, you know, certainly willing to or you know able to to, to direct otherwise. Uh, well, it was just to enhance what we thought would add some value. Albert's an equal. It's almost like an equal distance between the Alexander change on the Albert, and then your next one is. A curve down at Ironworks. So I think it's a good distancing. Are there any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. You've, you've given us a lot to yes. reflect on. And yeah, it's good. Very well. Okay. Make the savings. So thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And, and also for working with them, I think we incorporate some of, the, uh, some of the ideas into the St. Clair Street project so it's great so Thanks, safe Kelly. journey home yes we'll be in touch okay thank you okay next up we have mnp that are patiently waiting um to talk about our 2022 financial audit so if i may we have uh, jackie tesky and nyla uh sakic sick um, with us from MNP tonight to make presentations. So I'll turn over to uh, Jackie, I guess. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Bev. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, so I would like to go through the statements and then our audit findings report. Um, is there, does everyone have a copy with them or would you like me to put it up on the screen and go through it? It might be better if you put it on your screen. I'll just give you authority to do that. Okay. Okay, you should be good now, Jackie. Okay. Right. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, okay. So uh, before I begin, I want to say thank you to Tina and Jim again for another successful audit this year. Really appreciate all your help and assistance with the audit. Um, our team was uh, pretty proficient this year, so I'm uh, happy to present these to everyone today. Also, um, I Ashley Dodoni was not able to make it. She was triple booked, so I have to take the helm for her today. So I want to go to the, uh, I'll go to the table of contents here, just kind of outlines the statements. Um, the management's report here is noted, no changes to the wording here. So with our independent auditors report, we are issuing um, a clean opinion this year. Um, just to confirm, we did do, we conducted the audit in accordance with Canadian generally accepted accounting sta auditing standards. And then here, I just want to highlight the responsibility of man responsibilities of management and those charged with governance. So we do note that management is responsible for the preparation and fair presentation of these consolidated financial statements. 
That includes all of the details within the notes as well. Additionally, our auditors, our responsibility as auditors are outlined here as well in these bullet points, kind of just details what we've done. So no changes again to our auditor report here from what you would have seen in prior years. On to page four, we have the consolidated statement of financial position. So total financial assets um, was uh, 11, just shortly, uh, just slightly over 11 million. So a bit of an increase from the prior year. It's mostly due to the cash balance increase, as you can see. The liabilities was 1.6, a slight increase as well, um, also due to the deferred revenue portion. So net financial assets landed at nine, almost nine and a half million with an increase from the prior year of 8.3 million. Non-financial assets had a decrease at 26 million, and this is mostly due to the tangible capital assets that you see here. So accumulated surplus is 35 million, slight, slight decrease from the prior year. Any questions on this page before I continue? Okay, so page five, the statement of operations and accumulated surplus. Here you'll see the budget in the first column and then the actuals comparable. So budgeted total revenues was 7.3 million. Again, that doesn't take into account the share of net income from Blue Water Power. The actuals was 7.8 million, so a bit of an increase. And this is mostly due to the Blue Water Power and then also casino revenues being a little higher than expected. And then again, revenues were, were increased from prior years. So 6.7 million in the prior year and 7.8 million this year. Total expenses also had a slight increase, but rather comparable to what was budgeted. So annual surplus of 407,000. Any questions on this page before I continue? No. Okay, thank you. So page six shows the statement <coughs> of net financial assets. So again, where we talked where uh, financial assets less the financial liabilities was 9.4 million, shows kind of the impact that happened there. So the amortization of the tangible capital assets, the laws adjustment, prepaid, things like that. Following page is the statement of cash flows. So this is separated into four main categories, operating, capital, investing, and financing. So as you can see, the majority of the change in that cash flow in the year resulted from operating activities here. So 2 million, you had a 90,000 decrease from capital activities and then a 432,000 decrease in investing and nothing from financing. Overall, you had an increase in cash of 1.4 million to get to that 4.3 million at the end of the year. So before I go to the notes of the statement, are there any questions? I can't see if anyone is raising their hand, so please. Oh, oh, so you can keep going. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So um, to the notes of the financial statement, I wanna highlight that no significant accounting policy notes have changed here. So note one and all these accounting policies that we detail within. The one note that I would like to highlight that we have added in that would be different from the prior year is on page, I think it's the page uh, 12. Here we go. So page 12 of the statements, the notes of this financial statements, we have standards issued, standard issue, but not yet effective. And so here we wanna highlight this new standard that is impacting um, all public, uh, public accounting bodies. And, uh, and it's the asset retirement obligation of PS 3280. So essentially what it is requiring now is um, for any periods beginning on or after April 1st, 2022. So this will impact the village of Point Edwards financial statements for 2023. And where you have to account for any liability associated with retiring the retirement of an asset. So some, um, organizations and municipalities are bringing in consultants, some are doing it within, but there is going to be an impact to financial statements. We have discussed this as well with Tina and Jim. So again, no other changes to the notes. That's the only um, major one that we wanted to highlight. Jackie? And, yes? Could you go back to that new piece that needs to be done there that you just talked about and maybe give an example or two of what that might mean for us? So 
it's kind of it, it really depends but for, for what i would recommend doing is reviewing all your assets and seeing if there's like so this includes if you have asbestos in your assets and so you'd have to take care of the remediation of that asbestos and then you have to recognize that as a liability so um if you have like piping that has asbestos so you may have to have someone come in and um, review your asset listing to identify potential assets that you'd have to review. And then you, there are experts that you can um, uh, like work with that will help with this. Okay, so it's it's taking assets off our books that are that it's actually going to cost us money to do that. So it's, um, it's yeah. So if you had a building like an arena that had asbestos in the roof. And you haven't, and that asbestos is like exists at this point in time, and you're utilizing this arena. You have to un understand what the cost would be to remediate that asbestos, like, or if you were going to say discontinue the use of that arena, and the asbestos remediation was going to cost say one million. You have to take the present value of that one million, and then record that as a liability um, that you'll have to address in the future. That's a very extreme case. But um, just an easy example to give you. Thank you. So before I move to our audit finding report, are there any questions on the statements? Anyone have any questions? No, we're good. OK, thank you. So our audit findings report here. I'll go to the second page. So the status of our engagement is uh, substantially completed. So these bullet points here just kind of highlight what we need to address before we can issue our final auditor report. And we do plan to issue it for today's date upon approval of the, um, the statements. So we are waiting on the sign management rep letter. Again, this can't happen until the statements are approved and we have provided this to Tina and Jim to sign. We also would like to discuss any subsequent events with council management again, to make sure that we've captured any potential liabilities or things that we need to disclose. And then also we're waiting for council's review and approval of the consolidated financial statements. So no significant limitations were placed on the scope or timing of our audit. And we don't expect any unforeseen complications to arise in order to issue our auditor report. The following page here, we have audited, audit reporting matters. So here we know that there were no deviations to, from our audit service plan that was previously presented to you during our planning stages. Our materiality final was at 315,000, and that was a bit of an increase from the prior year. We base our materiality on gross revenues, so it's a 4% of gross revenues. And an easy way of looking at that is if you flip it and say 96% of the state, 96% of the statements are um, clean essentially. So materiality is a threshold of um, if we identify errors, then we propose these errors to Tina. We work with her and book the adjusting entries. Um, this is a very extreme case. No issues were identified here. We have uh, no identified or suspected fraud. No non-compliance with any laws or regulations were found. Uh, no significant matters. No going concern matters noted. No disclosure issues. We do have one recommendation for um, with regards to internal controls, and I'll discuss that at the end of this report. And then there were no matters arising from our discussions with management. So in our audit, there are two significant risk areas that we address. These are typical risks that we see in every single audit. So the first risk being fraud risk from revenue recognition, and it's a presumed risk of fraud. So what we do here is we perform tested details at a high risk level, and uh, we agree that to supporting documents um, to ensure that it's accurate and that revenue actually occurred. So no issues were identified with this testing performed. We also have a fraud risk from management override of internal controls. So this is another presumed risk that we have. And in order to essentially what that is, is like Tina or Jim have the ability to like override any internal controls. So Jim could go to Tina and say, hey, Tina, book this entry. Um, so what we do to address that risk is to we review all manual journal entries. We do a retrospective review of estimates, and then we evaluate the business rationale for, for significant unusual transactions. And again, no issues were identified during our testing. 
Again, we remain um, independent. And then we have a management rep letter that has been provided to Tina and Jim. And then we do have a few significant differences. So those are just our journal entries that we are proposing to Tina to, throughout the course of our audit that we have found any adjustments and that uh, we've gone through that with Tina and then she typically posts them at the end of the, uh, the audit. So the last thing to highlight here is, as I mentioned, we did have our recommendation in internal controls. So we noted during this, um, this audit that the vacation liability has grown a little bit. So it looks as if um, some employees are not taking vacation, that liability is kind of getting a little high. So we recommend that management work with employees to ensure that they're taking the vacation time and that that's happening. Does anyone have any questions? Any questions? Nothing. Thank you. Okay, so that's it for our audit report. And uh, again, thank you very much to Tina and Jim. It was a pleasure working with you again. And thanks for your presentation. Appreciate it. I have no idea how to stop sharing my screen. There we go. There we go. Thanks. So if there are no questions, the normal uh, process here would be to pass a motion accepting the final uh, the financial statements as circulated. If council is happy to do so. I'll second. Okay, all in favor? Okay. So Jackie, Tina, and I will get everything signed that you need back and we'll get that over to you tomorrow and on to okay. next year. Yeah, Thank and then you. we're just wrapping up the FIR and we'll be we'll be done shortly. So you'll have a great summer. Yep, <laughs> you as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you. Okay. We'll move on to the adoption of minutes. So we have three sets of minutes. And we could yep. I was just gonna move that all three uh Items under adoption of minutes be uh, adopted as circulated. Councillor Burgess. All in favor? No, oh, sorry. Any questions before we vote on any of the minutes? Okay. All in favor? Thank you. Okay. Business writing and tasks. Move on to financial reports. General operations. I'll move that the total revenues okay. and general operations for the month of May 2023 and the amount of $58,337.15 be approved, and that the total expenditures and general operations for the month of May of 2023 and the amount of $457,285.33 be approved. Seconder. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Noctor. Questions? All in favor? Okay. Thank you. Move on to environmental services. I think there's a typo in mine. Just usually the updated expenses or the previous month that says May again. Just want to make sure that gets corrected. Let me just have a look here. Yeah. I'm going to read it as April, okay. but it's it's written May. Yes, it should. Yeah, it should. good catch. Okay, I'll move that the total revenue and environmental services for the month of May 2023 and the amount of $592.88 be approved, and that the total expenditures and environmental services for the month of May 2023 and the amount of $109,289.70 be approved, and that the updated financial statements for the month of April 2023 showing revenues of $353,000. And expenses of one hundred seven thousand four hundred forty-four dollars and forty-eight cents be received and filed. Second. Second. Seconded by Deputy Mayor's eyes. All in favor? Thank you. Move on to committee reports. Operations first. I'll move that the operations committee uh, minutes be uh, adopted. Second. Seconded by Council Burgess. Before we vote, may I just have a couple of highlights, if I may? Um, where is it now? So the uh, public work staff have gone around and identified sidewalks that need grinding. You can see little 
or in stripes on your sidewalk, the, the grinding contract will be coming along uh, in a couple of weeks to take care of that. And um, the one was sorry. Yep. Happy New Year, Grind. Yep. Just the grinding is anything that's over three quarters, three quarters of an inch that's raised up gets marked, and then that has to be ground. So that's the tripping hazard. Thank you. Thank you. And then um, we did uh, make a recommendation in this uh, that. We do maintenance on the Olympia machine, and that would include the replacement of all four rims, um, and that the cost to do this maintenance be come out of the reserve fund for the Olympia, and the Olympia is the ice resurfacing machine of the arena. Okay. All in favor? Okay, moving on to fire committee. Um, do you want me to move that since I chaired it? Yes, please. Okay, so I'll move that the uh, minutes of the uh, fire committee Meeting held June 23rd, 2023, be approved as circulated. All second. Seconded by Councilor Mondew. June 13th. Oh, what? Yes. I think it said. It said June 23rd in the motion. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. First time I, I probably read it. Word. in there on the 23rd. First time I read it word for word. Normally I just wing it. So, um, and then the, the only uh, highlights there were. Um, um, the uh, the engine truck we are moving forward and uh, staff have been given the um, the authority to work with um, E1 and uh, to get this moving forward because uh, price increases are coming uh, upon us. Um, Fire department will be meeting with the new principal at Bridgeview School to make sure that we have our our good program already in place and we are actively working on with the roofing contractor for both a library and the fire hall roof to get that um, issue dealt with as soon as possible. And that's all. And welcome to the new committee chair. Gets to do the moving forward. We appreciate you filling in. No problem. So you can go back to one committee <laughs> for, the next, for the next month. I can sleep, for sleep, July, I, I can right? sleep in again. Yeah. <laughs> move on to environmental services. I'll move that the minutes of the environmental services committee meeting held June 13th, 2023 be approved as circulated. All second. Council Mandu. All in favor? Okay. Finance. I'll move that the minutes of the Finance Committee meeting held June 13th be approved as circulated. All second. Thank you. I just have one one highlight, and uh, we'll we'll be talking about it in new business. And now uh, we had a report from uh, staff on insurance deductible options. Which will be a new business item five or item two this evening. Okay, all in favor? Yes, Carrie. Okay, move on to miscellaneous reports. One and two. I'll move that the building permit report dated June 9th, 2023, uh, be received and filed. Okay. All in favor? Next one's police service board. Move to receive and file a police service report. That's for March and April. Seconded. All second. Yeah. Just like this yep. day too, I appreciate yep. the activity report that's in there that everything the OPP have been doing, um, all the action that they take, and that's all documented in there. It's oh, good to see. It's good reading. Thank you. We'll pass that on to the sergeant. Yeah. Okay. All in favor? Okay. And patients receive and file one through five. One through six. Sorry. We do we do one through five and then six. Separately. Okay, one through six. Okay, one through five is pretty straightforward. I'll move uh, one through five. Thank you. Uh Senator. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Thank you. We'll move on to St. Clair Conservation Authority minutes. Um, I'll, I'll move that the uh, St. Clair Region Conservation Authority meeting highlights from April be uh, received and filed. I'll second. And just uh, two quick things I wanted to talk about in that was mm -hmm. um, erosion control projects. Uh, one include is um, we've received some funding um, for the water uh, by the water treatment plant. So um, I'll share that with you. I don't know if you saw that, but right. yeah, yeah, we got some grants. That we just got. Yeah, yeah. just got, yeah. yeah. So we're quite happy about that. Yeah. Um, 
the Sinclair Renew Cost we went through a risk management program with the insurer. Um, it was a fun exercise, but what it has identified is a number of things that have now become quite contentious at the, at the campgrounds and all that stuff as far as structures being added onto trailers and the like. So it's really created a lot of work at their end, but um, there were just a lot of items that were out there that, um, that were just not safe and they're trying to work with the people. And then the other one was just the levels on the Great Lakes. And they're saying, um, uh, they remain above average over the next six months, but they're not at all as high as they were, if we all recall back in 2020 when Venetian Boulevard flooded. So, so we're still in good shape as far as water levels. So yeah. that's all, thank you. So when I, I attended, I had talk, talked to you about attending the AGM mm -hmm. and that was quite a contentious issue that came up about um, these illegal add-ons and whatnot at different campgrounds that some had been there for 20 years and there's quite a bit of a, discussion and not everyone was agreeing with whether they're going to be addressed or grandfathered or what what's going to happen yeah. long term but yeah. um create a lot of work for yeah, everybody so. it's a lot but some of it had been for a very long time yes yeah well thank you for sharing um all in favor okay so we'll move on to new business the first one is 2022 environmental services year-end resolutions I'll take that one. Thank you. Um, I'll move that $383,237.71 be transferred into account number 01-4040-0420 for the Dichester work and valve work that was not completed in 2022 and that the funds be brought back into the 2023 budget to complete the work. Thank you. I'll second that. Seconded by Councilman Duke. Okay, all there. And then the second item on there is that $120,359.32 be trans transferred into revenues for Environmental Services Department from account number 01-4040-0410 to cover the 2022 Environmental Services Department deficit. I'll second that. Okay. All in favor? Thank you. The next one is the question around the insurance deductible options. So I contacted our insurer and they gave us some options around our liability and property insurance. Um, we are currently at a 10,000 deductible on liability and 5,000 on property and increase. There is a chart there that talks about the different uh, savings that we would have annually if we were to increase those deductibles. Um, so clearly there's a risk to an increasing deductibles. It's, you know, right now, if we have an incident, the first 10,000 comes through the village. If we change that deductible, the first 25,000 would come. That would resolve in this, result in a savings annually of 10,247. Um, so our, I think the staff recommendation would be to put those savings into our reserve. Um, so that in the instance down the road, if you had, if we had a, a claim that we'd have the money uh, set aside. So, um, you know, you're you're kind of choosing, are you going to pay ahead or are you going to put some money into the bank to pay for a potential eventual claim? Um, and it's, I guess it's really just a matter of what council is comfortable with uh, doing. The other thing is we can do this at any time. So we're, you know, we're basically mid year right now. So if we were to choose to change the, deductibles now we would result in basically we'd get half that savings if we you know the numbers are gonna be a little bit different next year if we you know if we wait until 2024 to implement this change the numbers will change because premiums just change but that's you know I guess the point is if we do it now we're only going to save half that money I just want to give some background to this um why we even consider it is um our insurance went up Probably about, uh, four, it's about 60% the last four years. Yeah, last four years. So it's a matter of financial consideration is it continues to rise. We're not, we have no way to, um, we're, we're actually the um, Association of Municipalities of Ontario is working to try to work together to find a way to work on these insurance issues because it's hitting all municipalities. 
Um, but until that day, we have to uh, find a way to be able to afford it. So this was one consideration of increasing the deductible. Well, the same as a homeowner would do, mm -hmm. consider going to a higher deductible to try and save some costs. So um, that's where that's why we're even looking at it. So I just wanted to give that context. Deputy Mike Grimes? Um, through you to, uh, to uh, Mr. Burns, um, did our broker have any feedback on the risk and the reward? Not particularly. I think her, she concurred with the idea of putting some money into a reserve. Um, she said, you know, that she would recommend that at least until you get a reserve built up, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's, that would be up to council to decide what they're comfortable with, but she definitely recommended putting aside for three or four years, those savings so that if the eventual claim comes along, you have it, have some money there to, uh, you know, it's not just, it's not completely found money. Mm -hmm. um, you'll have your savings each year and, and eventually you might get to a point where you, where you realize the savings in the year, if you get your reserve built up, just if a hundred thousand is the right number, then when you get it there, then you, then you can start uh, just taking the savings and, and, you know, maybe you can go a few years with no claims and, and you, uh, you just leave it. And then if you need to build your reserve back up down the road, if you get a couple claims, you can start uh, putting some money into the reserve at that point. So. And then just Paul, on me, in your memo, we, we don't see the, our claims history. Mm -hmm. So how, how frequent are claims in liability and property um, ballpark? Not very often. I got a, a report from her that was about the last uh, 10 or 12 years, and there's been six or seven claims. Most of them have been very minor things that, um, that really else. you would deal with. I think there's only been one that we've actually dealt with through our insurance. Well, the rest um, we settled outside yeah, that. Yeah. Slip and falls on the walkway type of thing. Right. Yeah. And then property, property includes these buildings and vehicles yeah. and the like. So yeah. Okay, thank you. So the other thing is, I mean, over a couple of years, perhaps I, I don't feel confident that we're going to see I this issue's been talked about for so long. For years. And AMO has promised and everybody's saying they're gonna work on it, work on it for as long as I can remember. And, but we can hope that they make some resolution in the future, and then we may decide to make a change again. So it doesn't mean that it has to be forever if we yeah. increase it. Something on do? To the chair, uh, I just want to let the people know what we do pay for insurance a year. $350,760.32. So that's why this is becoming a big issue. Uh, we also have about $16,500 in a reserve right now. So there is reserve starting. So just throw those numbers out there. And if I may, if we if we were to move both deductibles to fifty thousand, we would almost our savings would almost cover our our first claim. Yeah. And with <laughs> Councilor Mondu's uh, information on the sixteenth, we would have more than the fifty thousand required. Yeah. Um, in that right, almost well, we'd only get half that this year. Right, yeah, right. So, yeah. so we'd have 39, 20, we'd have 36,000. 30, yeah. So, yeah. so it's not as big a risk as it could be. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know a lot of, when when I worked at Rogers, our deductible was a million dollars. We essentially consider ourselves self-insured and we paid all the risk. And uh, it was only for a catastrophic claim that we would, mm -hmm. we would use our insurance. So much different environment, but I mean, uh, there is that thought of mm -hmm. how far do you self-insure yourself to save money? Yeah. So I just, if you want to make any changes, I guess. Do we need a motion? If a someone, motion and I contact the insurer. And someone wants to make a motion to move forward on a, a change fault, or? Is this fault of finance? <laughs> 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 To me, if I, I don't think I, I wouldn't go to a fifty thousand claim on property. That's pretty high, and, and the savings is only yes, four hundred dollars for a year. So I, I don't. I think I think I might consider the fifty thousand on liability, but I would probably just stay with the ten thousand on property. Um, we've had two claims submitted in the last three weeks for an incident that 
our insurer tells us we will not be held liable for. Um, one claim was about 26,000 and the other one was about 6,000. So, and our insurer tells us that the people do not have a case, but they submitted the claims. So, um, yeah. so I mean, those, you know, they're unusual that we get these claims, but when they happen, they're not, they're not cheap. So I would, you know. And just to, if I can to clarify, property you said leave at ten thousand, but it's at five thousand now. Yeah. So or no, sorry, I mean increase to ten thousand. Okay. Thank you. Like I would consider increasing it to ten thousand. Yeah. Okay. And then going liability to fifty, you're saying? I think you so. I mean, there's yeah. we don't have a lot of liability claims, and you're saving a substantial amount of money. Yes. So um, you put that savings and premiums aside for two or three years, and and you've got. You know, you've got your protection built in. So. Okay, I'll make, yes. I'll make a motion that we uh, increase our liability deductible to fifty thousand, and our property deductible to ten thousand. I'll I'll second that. Seconded by Deputy Rick Grimes. Any other questions? All in favor? Thank you. So again, we'll get half of the change this year because it's we're in June now. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next one is the gateway casino tax reassessment. So this is the issue we've been talking about for two or three years now, where we, we were there two or three years ago, that gateway would be appealing their assessments right back to 2017 when they took over uh, operations. So unfortunately, there's not, the, so the village in each tax year puts out their assessments and you know it's spread across the classes and we don't there's nothing you can do if somebody appeals their assessment there's nothing you can do to go back and regain that assessment from other properties so um we started putting money aside um back in 20 or 21 and we've put aside uh where is my number here 160. yeah a little 160 no, one, short um, 315. Yeah, 315. Thanks, Tina. Um, so, yeah, we put aside 315, and the village portion is going to be 475 after them not paying the rest of their portion this year. They've made one payment, correct, Tina? Yes. So, if they, they don't make their next, their two final payments for this year, we owe them $475,126.96. We've got 315 in the bank. To pay that, so to, to to finish it off, we would need to take one hundred and sixty thousand out of one of our reserves to to do this. There's nothing. I mean, they were asking for a lot more. <laughs> um, yeah. The the numbers like they were assessed at thirty three million. They wanted to drop it down to like eleven or twelve million, and I mean, it would have we it would have been difficult okay. to ever pay that. It would have been very difficult. So. Um, um, can I just add one thing? It's not Gateway Just Point ever. It's no. every Gateway facility. It's, so let's and, just yeah. I want to be clear about that. And it's Cross it's Ontario. not even just Gateway. It's every casino. Every casino. Sorry, not yes. just not just Gateway ones. So. I just didn't want it to think that we were set centered mm -hmm. out because That's it's beyond that. Deputy Mayor Grimes. Um, there's talk in your memo about um, recovering funds from the county and the board of education. Mm -hmm. There's no risk with that, right? Like they're obligated to. Yeah. No, and I've done that with the second quarter payment. Oh, you've reduced the second quarter payment yeah. to the county and the board of ed? To the board, yeah. Perfect. That's a better way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It is. I mean, it, well, it's a nice right. way to get it yeah. dealt with. Yeah. Because yeah. yes. it, it, it would be, it would, it would create a cash flow problem for us a little bit to, yeah. to pay it all out at once yeah. and, and not be getting it back from the county and school board. So. Or sorry, Council Burgess. How many questions do you see, Ayo Burns? You know who you are. <laughs> uh, can we expect to see this happen again next year? With another appeal? I don't Good. believe so. Yeah, like they're, they've made an agreement to agree to the assessment that they have now. So I do believe their agreement is just up until 2023. But, you know, they've agreed on what the assessed value is for today. Yeah, there's nothing stopping them from appealing next year. Will their taxation will be based on this new $22 million number, but yeah, potentially they could. Just want to know how long it's going to continue. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. 
Do we need a motion to move this money? Uh, just to reach, well, or you know, it probably would be appropriate to have a motion to to top up the funds needed to come out of the emergency reserve to, to top up the funds needed to pay off the the balance. Um, that's that's where it would come from is the emergency reserve. So, but you are we going to wait till the end of the year to see what our position was? Yeah, that's the other option mm -hmm. is just to to wait. I mean, if by chance we have a large surplus at the end of the year, then you don't need to do. Okay. But we can make a motion at the end of the year too to to review. Okay. That's right. so, I like that. That works. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. I just didn't know if we wanted to do it now. Yeah. Or yeah. Normally we do wait. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. So, so we will so we receive and file that report. Did so? Did you make the motion, did yeah. Councilor Monty? Make the motion? No. 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 We're not doing it. We're going to wait no, until then. We'll wait. I, okay. I'm sorry. Can we we'll just make a motion? We receive and file. We need to do that. Okay. All in favor? Oh, wait, seconder. I need a seconder. Something left over? Okay, sure. Councillor Burgess. All in favor? Okay. okay. Community events and public announcements. I just wanted to thank. Just there's. Sorry. New, sorry. Councillor Grimes sent out an email this morning for new business you wanted to bring up tonight. Oh. What was that? It was the. Oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's just the bridge walk here. Yeah. I. I, I wanted to, uh, my suggestion was that we need to talk to the bridge before we go any further yep. because there's a lot of work involved and it's uh, a very short time period. Normally the bridge, when it was done before, it's a year of planning. So I didn't want to get into a lot of work mm -hmm. and um, if they weren't supportive. Yeah. So, uh, so we're just going to refer it back to so I was I, I was going to share with Joe. Um, yep. from the bridge and get his review. Mm -hmm. The other issue is typically they have to go to Ottawa to get any decisions right. too. So I, I'm concerned about the timeline. Okay. But uh, if I do that now, maybe I'll have the information by next committee, okay. which is in two weeks. Yep. Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure it was yeah, no, moving I, and staying. I didn't send it to him yet because I was going to talk about it tonight. So, right, okay, yeah. Um, and make sure everybody was agreeable. Okay. Yeah, I think that's the right approach. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, it's, it's, their, well, if, it's their property. If they say no, then there's no point in putting any time into yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. organizing. Um, the other thing is I just wanted to uh, thank our staff and all those that were involved in putting together our Canada Day down at the waterfront. Um, I haven't had any negative feedback. I had a lot of visitors and attendees that were impressed and enjoyed it and got to see lots of people and we went through a thousand pieces of pizza 2000 2, pieces of pizza was totally gone cupcakes i never even saw them they were gone <laughs> so um and appreciate uh, all of the vendors that helped us out um such as uh, blue water power provided the pizza paid for it um the casino that came and um gave us the fake check and uh the Optimus Club supported out. us. The Optimus helped. And it's my understanding the, the casino paid for all the cupcakes as well. Is that, I so. That's what I heard. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention that night we unveiled our new little library. For anybody that hasn't seen it, it's on a pole off the trail by the fish hatchery. So there's uh, this is the first location outside of the city um, put together by Lambton Literacy. Desjardins, Insurance, and the Rotary Club. So they approached the village and asked if they could uh, put one here and we're glad to accept it. So that was unveiled on Canada at our party as well. And then this Saturday is the Canada Day for the city of Sarnia. The parade starts at 11.30 on Lakeshore Road. The um, festivities, organization part of it starts at one o'clock. So I hope that the weather <laughs> improves and the, the, the mm -hmm. smoke goes away before the parade. So we'll see what happens. Oh, um, can I just Council, make a comment yeah. on the library? Yeah. It's very well used. There's only a handful of books left. I was there last, last night. I hope they come back. There are <laughs> what, half dozen books. Oh. If that, and that was full. I better get some down. Yeah, it was full. It was full. It. So my wife has some to take down. So yeah, I'll I tell her there's an urgent need to yeah. replenish the library. I can, I've got some at home too. Anything else that anybody She's not knows using your cookbooks at all. So oh, yeah, I have some of those. I, can <laughs> I thought these were kids. <laughs> 
all um, ages. Yeah. Anybody else have any things happening in the near future? Um, just the um, Rotary Club Mackinac Pancake Breakfast oh. is happening in mid July um, uh, down under the waterfront. And I think we've talked about this in the past. They are still going ahead with their second tent. Are, are yes. They, you might have more. You want to talk about it? You have more details in um, I, I don't have specific, specifics in front of me, but the um, mimosa high end breakfast event by Rotary is at the field owned on the Garvinese land. Um, and it doesn't impact the other Rotary activity because of two special, two different, very different events. The pancake breakfast will go forward. Um, the uh, fancy breakfast is raising money for um, affordable housing. So it's an initiative to raise a lot of funds and it's um, some people that are, uh, John DeGroote is one of the people, Heather Martin's one of the people uh, in the committee that's raising funds for affordable housing through this event. Okay. All right. On to bylaws. On to bylaws. Number 18. So this so, is. Okay. Yep, you go ahead. Okay, so this is the bylaw to, open, to uh, regulate open air burning. Um, we did have a request from Mr. Bolter to address council this evening okay. and met the deadlines to do that. So. so we need, do we need to, a motion or write a, no, you can come up inside the bar. And I hope you don't see a lot more of me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm responding because I, I did see um, through you, Mr. Grimes' email, um, <laughs> and I understand, you know, the reasons why some people might be upset if they have to change the location of a built-in kind of fire pit and or they've done some work around landscaping around that and I quite understand that um and from the photographs I saw a lot of those situations seem to be they had their own structures on their property that the buyers were close to and I understand that you know that's fine and, and maybe at a situation like that three meters could work even though we can tell but three meters um when you're putting your own property at risk is a different thing to three meters when you're dealing with a property line and a previous property, <laughs> such as our situation, which I think you know a little about. So, um, um, you know, so our concern is that um, sparks travel often seven, eight, nine feet. Um, and uh, if there's a wind even further, and I'm thinking that if you're going to consider changing that distance, uh, we're talking five meters is about 16 feet, three meters is five, 10 feet. Um, if you're going to make that change, I think it's a different situation when you're a property owner and you're awake at night and your neighbor has a fire and you're worried about the proximity of that fire to your own building, your own shelter, your own uh, uh, property line. And I'm also thinking that if the purpose of a bylaw is to balance, balance rights, um, then why would you have, why wouldn't you make sure that in terms of interaction between neighbors, you have more distance because that, that can influence smoke, it can influence, you know, all those, all those um, things that, as we know, can create neighbor disputes. So I'm suggesting that if you are going to look at changing those distances, um, I still think five meters makes a lot of sense, safety first. But if you're going to consider that, then within the bylaw, I'd ask that you say three meters from a structure on your own property. However, if it's a um, property line and or a structure, your neighbor's structure, you should be at uh, you should be at a minimum of five meters, sixteen point four feet, because I think that would alleviate a lot of potential issues. We lie awake at night, worried. So um, we're asking you to consider our safety. Thank you. Remember the trees, though. Well, that's valid. Um, well, the three meters to combustibles are in there, right? Yes. So that's that's different to structure, and we'll see we'll see if that works or not. So we appreciate the opportunity to speak at this last moment on this bylaw, and we look forward to. Uh, 
to move it forward. Thank you. Does anyone have any comments? Um, in my note, I had a number of, I told me to go through them as individual sure, motions. Like um, should yeah, we do as sure. motions or? Um, I just want depends. It, oh, yeah. Sorry, I just want to make a comment before we get into that part yeah. of it. One, one of the things that we did consider when you say lie awake at night, we did make the change to say that a buyer is out at midnight. Oh, and I'm the sure. reason for that yeah. is for the peace of mind yeah. um, and to allow that time period where there is no smoke or you don't have to worry about a lit fire. So people have asked, you know, why the midnight? And that is to provide a time of day that people wouldn't necessarily be impacted. I understand. I go to bed around 10 in the week. Well, just so you know. <laughs> okay. We compromised at midnight. Yes. Sparks do happen before midnight. They happen the whole evening that fire is on and up. Our trees, dead branches underneath are three meet, oh, approximately three meters away. And then our property and garage building is, you know, closer. And that's our concern. Those trees go up, our garage goes up. It's very straightforward. And there should be some kind of accommodation for specific situations for all we're saying. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yep. I have a quick question. Yep. Um, Councilor Burgess. Where does this take us as far as timelines? Um, I appreciate the time that the deputy mayor put into getting feedback from residents. Does this push us back another month or two now? It doesn't have to. I mean, this everything has been circulated. So the version that was approved for public circulation was emailed and through Facebook and our constant contact um, approximately 10 days ago, give or take a day. Like it was a full week and then like the Thursday before that or the Wednesday or Thursday. So public's had a chance to see it that way for 10 days. And then the version that has that covers off the changes that were discussed in council or Deputy Mayor Grimes' email has been circulated as well. So um, that information has been out there for public consumption. Um, so it really is up to council. If you want to pass a bylaw tonight, you can. It's it's totally up to you. I just know we spent multiple hours one morning with our lawyer, mm -hmm. and everybody was okay. But then there was some definitions that we had to tweak again. Yeah. I'm and just public had that. 10 days, roughly. Yeah. Okay. Has, has there been any other public feedback? I have not received any, no. Okay, because I, I know. I'm what. sorry. There was the email that the oh, council sorry. received from Gary yeah. Lounsbury. Oh, right, and the, and the letter Yesterday. from public health. Yeah. Yesterday. That's what we were, and so that's something, you know, that letter that was circulated to council yesterday from public health as well. I didn't see anything new on that, though. It's the only yeah the only. to death for a while and all that information and stuff that's been presented before about smoke and things like that and proximities and mm -hmm. I found it curious that we got it at the time that we did especially after how much discussion has been going on with this particular item. Um, does this have to go back to our lawyer again? No, I don't think so. I, no, I don't. Um, the one I mean, you might want to get an opinion on distance from her if you, if you wish to. It's up to council. I mean, um, Mayor Hand did some research this afternoon and the city bylaw is three meters. Um, so it's it's really up to council to make that. There's no rules anywhere that say three meters or five meters. Um, the decision to look at five meters was made at by council and um, it, it's really up to council to decide how they want to go about that. Okay. Through the chair. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question and I sent it in an email and it was uh, wood pallet barbecues. They're quite popular. And uh, I did cite an example where the city of Windsor has a no burn policy, totally no burn. Can't burn anything, but they allow wood pallet barbecues as cooking appliances. Now you walk into Lowe's Home Depot, they're all on display. So I'm just wondering, it's not an allowable fuel right now for a cooking appliance. So I'm just bringing that question forward. Do we, would we consider them cooking appliances? Because there's, they're somewhat similar to a smoker because we did 
put smokers in here, right? So I'm just that it would be a simple change to, yeah, to add in you know. an acceptable fuel. Um, it would be a it would be one of those devices that as long as you're using it according to the manufacturer's uh, guidelines. So if you have the wood pallet, wood pellets as an additional fuel source, that change can be made very easily. Yeah, because they've got a stack on them and everything, right? They're like a little stove. So I'm just bringing it up because it's gonna it's gonna come up, right? We know it. I was under the impression that most smokers use those. I mean, there are there are smokers that use wood that pellets. real wood too. Yeah. But, um, yeah. It's like you, who knows what the fuel source might come up with. You know, maybe you'll start burning corn three years from now. Maybe you'll, you know, who knows what but the future this, might bring. Is this so, a brand name that we're talking about, a smoker versus a wood pellet? Or is it mm -hmm. under the same, if you were to look up definitions, if you're purchasing an appliance versus a, a range, you know, gas range yeah. or whatever, is yeah. it? To me, the appliance, I mean, an appliance is, a, like, people are going to be, we, the, the staff at the village, are going to be fairly reasonable about what is a cooking appliance? Um, you know, it, it might list a few examples there, but if somebody comes in and says, you know, I bought this this device at Home Depot and it uses this fuel source, if it's something that's manufactured for that purpose, we're not going to we're not going to be issuing tickets okay. for that type of thing, right? So, I mean, I think a cooking appliance is well enough to find. I think it does not hurt to add commercial wood pellets as an acceptable burn material. And I don't, I think that okay. would I just thought I'd bring it up because it, it's gonna come up, I believe. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's possible. Totally inappropriate, I'm sure, but I've read that pellets are injected with chemical, if there's a chemical preservative in pellets that causes a health risk, I feel it my obligation to bring that forward to council at this point. Yeah. And my further, Suggestion on that is yeah, okay. you, you need to know that the city of Sarnia requires a spark arresting grate yes, on top, which may be why they've gone to the three meters for safety. Yeah, I, it was five meters. No, it's three. three. Okay, yeah. I checked it today. Oh. I'm sorry, I just needed to get that. Thank out. you. Um, okay, you guys said that you sent out um, Facebook and all that stuff. Is that what email was that? Was that the new? Um, what you voted on, or his last time I bought anything was just I uh, was the rewording from and um, when we came last, I was it? I think before we came, and it was just the rewording. And you guys know that I'm right here, like I'm over here. Um, but it's uh, and I, I usually get all the emails, but that was the last email I got, mm -hmm. except for the one that we did today about uh, this here, but. I haven't received an email um, stating what you guys were just talking about. So, do you are you signed up for that constant contact? Oh yes. Yeah. So I don't know the exact date off. Approximately the fifteenth or sixteenth of June is when it would have went out. Because uh, you know I, I get all of the stuff from you guys, obviously, um, on the thing, but um, but and that, that's I'm just kind of curious when you were saying that. Thing. No, I know that you said Facebook and such things, but I didn't get anything. I'm not quite sure why or or how it was missed. I don't know if it was missed. I, I go through my email several mm -hmm. times a day, and I've never... Did you send it out yourself? It comes from... I think it just would be addressed from the village of Point Edward. Yeah. So, so it, it doesn't come directly from me. Mm -hmm. It Like we have, it's a web-based mass email service so you log into this website you can have it like i could have it come from you if i really wanted to i mean that wouldn't make you know i wouldn't do that but um so it it comes from i believe the email says it's coming from the village of point edward and it might say constant contact on it i i don't i didn't get anything like that and i i am on the mm -hmm. constant contact but i'm just i'm pointing that out because i, I was confused as to you know you guys are I'm saying both these things that are going into place and you know everybody's gotten it but I have it and it's not that you know there's, there's no motions out here right now wondering. so we're debating about nothing right now that's all it, you know I'm, I'm confused about this to why yeah I I know like I know I got a response from people that got it Did so I can't 
I think that's what you're. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's that's, oh, yeah. yeah. There was questions that came in from that. Okay. So I can't understand. Like, well, I don't know how to we'll drop one person, but and it is on, basically two things that were under discussion. Okay. That were probably changed from the last meeting. Okay, and, and then one is the distance. Just used yeah. Wait a minute. Yeah, it was one, fine. It's one thing was the distance, and the other one was who. Oh, and, and day like the, the days. You can do it every day now, every day from okay. noon till midnight. Until midnight. Okay, and thank you. Yeah. Uh, again, I just yeah. don't know why it. I, I was just. I can't. On the page. I don't. My copy's in there, so I can't give it to you right now. But I can get and it. And we're okay. Here. That's fine. Thank I, you. I think it was the, the hard stop at midnight as well. It was saying that yeah, we put that in. Yep. Okay. That, you know, fires out at midnight. Yeah. Okay. 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 Right. Um, the Mr. Grimes's amendment, however, it hasn't been moved. It hasn't been moved, but um, it has not. It was not seen. I had asked if there was anything on the agenda for this weekend on Friday. I was told no, there was nothing more. That he hadn't seen the agenda, and then I see on the agenda that a private meeting was held prior to this. Whatever, and. I and so the, the consequence is I read on this weekend of this amendment. So it is a last minute. There has been no, this is the public meeting for it. And I'm sure a lot of people haven't seen it. So it is a bit of a concern for us. Yes, that it should be, you know, it should have been had more discussion because this is a last minute. We were quite happy with the, uh, with the, Proposal that you had before us, it was fair and equitable, and it, it was good. But this is a bit of a knock. There was no private meeting. I was not at a private meeting, and none of us were at a private meeting. So I believe Deputy Mayor Grimes had conversations, but there was no meeting that I was aware of. Or any of us were aware of. Yeah. Okay. It was a conversation. I just want to make that clear because I didn't know or wasn't there. Okay. Conversation then. I think the yeah. confusion was from the from your email. Well, using the word meeting yeah. okay. was throwing people off because right. yeah. it wasn't we weren't involved in that meeting to have that discussion. And nor was I. No. <laughs> okay, so just one one more question yeah, sorry. before we go. Uh cooking appliances. Uh there's some or is, is this going to be your motion? Well, I just, I'm hoping to get to these motions yeah, at some point in time. I've I've seen, I've read recently where cooking appliances and because they can be up to 20, they need to be 24 inches away from a combustible surface. Mm -hmm. So I'll just throw that out there. I know we're, you know, we're, I think there's confusion around how far they can be from from structures and all that now. So anyways, go ahead. May I? Yes. Thank you. The first one I'd like to do is, and I think Jim has done this, but is add the definition of structure from the conference is only by a lot. Yep. That is, word for word. Okay. And is everyone okay with that? Should we do that as a motion or a second? Oh, I'm splitting it up on the screen. Okay. So we use the word structure throughout the um, um, throughout the bylaw numerous times. And so the first one is adding the definition of structure, it's just a housekeeping thing. The second one was under cooking appliance, we called it a, a permanent cooking appliance, we call a structure, this, I, you want to right past it, right, yeah. yeah, right there. So my suggestion based on the conversation was that we change that to something like apparatus because the term structure in the bylaw now has it's its own meaning. And so, um, a permanent cooking apparatus, a permanent apparatus was my recommendation. Um, that was the only thing I could find in the source that was similar to structure. So does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Um, and then the other one was um, safe location. Uh, my proposal there is to change five meter to three meter. I went out in my own personal backyard and paced out five meters from my shed, five meters from my tree, five meters from my hedges, five meters from my house. Um, I had about a 10 by 10 square area in the middle of my backyard. And based on the bylaw with the safe location and all these distances, I'd have to put my fire pit, my barbecue, my smoker, my pizza oven, all within this 10 by 10 square foot area. Um, 
So I felt it was very somewhat limiting. And then also to the residents that I spoke with built um, fire pits or permanent structures and two of them even wrote to the fire department as early as February of last year and said, what do I need to know? And they said, three meters from structures. They went and built it. One of them spent $40,000 on a complete backyard landscaping, built a deck, did everything. And he has a pergola, as you saw in the pictures, and that would put him out of compliance. And so that's why I'm recommending we go back to the three meter that's standard in numerous municipalities. It's the standard practice. Um, and we could add the spark arrestor, but at this point, I'm just looking at changing to three meters. Consensus on that one or any discussion on that? I, just, oh, go ahead. You go ahead. No. I, I think if the fire department is comfortable with three meters, then I would be comfortable with three meters as well. This is for cooking, or this is not for cooking, this is for recreational fires. Right. right. Yeah. So the cooking appliance, as long as you're following the regulations, the manufacturer is stated. You're okay. good. Thank you. Yeah, I just this, wanted to clarify. Yeah. And, well, at this step, I'm only changing the definition of safe location. And then the next one is removing safe location from fire, from barbecue. So, so this one is only the definition of safe location. Perfect. Yeah, I can go with three minutes. Okay. Based on the fire department recommendation. And then the, the next one I had was recreational fire was just changed it to be fueled by acceptable burn materials must take place in a safe location, meaning that if it's a propane or natural gas fueled fire, you follow the manufacturer's guidelines that we list in paragraph A on all of those. Right? Is that where it is in A? So that the people that made the gas or propane fire pit or barbecue do a lot of testing and studying of and so in their manual we've all those nine pages of safety stuff that none of us read in there it says must be two meters away from this or cannot be used here or shall be this they're covering their liability by giving us all that information so i think we should defer to them on what makes a good spot for my barbecue and if we leave safe location and that means everybody has to take their barbecue and put it three meters away from the house and asked to put it out in the on the grass part of the yard. And I think people are used to barbecuing um, where they barbecue. So so I my proposal was to remove safe location from um, change recreational fires to say acceptable burn materials and then cooking appliances or cooking fires remove the term safe location. 4G. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah remove 4G altogether. That's yeah. when it's blue. Yeah. yeah. And then the last one was one, um, and I know that I know Jim, you didn't put it in here, so I think there might not be agreement on your part. But paragraph fourteen um, was where we can transfer fines and fees related to a tenant having a fire. Oh, okay, yeah. Sorry, That's I okay. have to declare a conflict. Sorry, I didn't know this was going to come up. Okay, I'm a land for yeah. on my own. Um, so this allows us to transfer fines, penalties, charges, and fees to the um, landlord. And the couple of people I spoke with said, um, you know, the tenant board right now, it's tough to maneuver through. If you're having problems with a tenant, that tenant could just have a fire every Friday night, um, have the fire trucks respond, create large fees, get transferred to the landlord as part of a landlord tenant dispute. Um, I could go either way on this, um, but he, this person felt it weaponizes the tenant in a way to have be vindictive towards their landlord. And they could have a fire, they could even call in their own complaint on their fires or their friends could and generate um, fines. And every Friday could generate, you know, and our, our fees for service for the fire department are in around $1,000 per call. So somebody could generate a ton of fees for service back on their landlord, move out, and the landlord's hung to this. So I think what we should be doing is going after the tenant that has lit the fire because the landlord did not like the fire. The landlord did not do anything wrong. Yet we're proposing that that landlord gets hammered with possibly thousands of dollars in fees. And we should just pursue the, the tenant either in small claims court through civil actions or the issuance of provincial offenses notices. So my proposal is to remove paragraph 14. 
I don't know if that has to be reworded or just deleted completely. Um, whether you have to say that the tenant is solely responsible, the person having the fire is solely responsible for the mm -hmm. for the fire. So. Okay. I mean, if we take it out, that I'm, I'm not. It wasn't that I was opposed to it. I just thought it needed to be okay fleshed out a little bit. Yeah, so I didn't want right. to remove it. If okay. Yeah. Talk about it. Yeah. Um, so I I think. There aren't a whole lot of tools out there to collect from a tenant. Mm -hmm. um, we can make every effort. You know, we would. We would make every effort possible to try and collect that yeah. fine from them. Um, whether we'd be successful or not, I don't know. I think we also need to remember a lot of these situations. The fines, are you, we, you may get a fine. You may get charged a fee. You, it's not you shall. Right. So there's some uh, leeway for the... Uh, people doing the enforcements of this. Um, we take that section out completely. Now we do say in 15 as well that any mm -hmm. unpaid amounts, fines, penalties, or charges issued will be added to the tax roll. Now that's for the property owner, mm -hmm. but it's how we deal with the tenant. Mm -hmm. If we leave it, it's because we do that with the water right now. But right. I think I think water is water. different in that as a landlord, I have an obligation to make sure there's water. And the fact that I pass it on to my tenant is my doing. So maybe maybe both 14 and 15, we should we change the word shall to may. Does that soften it enough? Within the three days of the, 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 the property of the property may be invoiced for the charges required to make payment within a period of 30 days. Or maybe we just change it to say something like we're going to work with the owner to try to collect payment as well. I yeah. I understand where you're coming from. But take that out of there. It's, it's a. It's and I think quite we've a, all heard the horror stories about tenants who try to get even with their landlord or whatever. And it, may, it would probably never happen, but it was brought to my attention by somebody who was a landlord and said mm -hmm. that they um, were concerned about that as okay. far as that weaponizing of the. So we we can remove it if you, I mean it's. I think it is one of those things that would get used very little, mm -hmm. but we can remove it if, if that's the, um, the, the wish of the council. I agree. If there's an issue, we can always put it back. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, and then I, 15, though, I think we need to leave yes. there because yeah. it could be the owner that's yes. creating the problem. Yeah. So I think we should change it to shall to may. Okay. But, um, Okay, okay, so we'll take out 14 and change shall to may in 15. Okay. okay. And then the last part is, and this is your opinion, do you feel that this these changes warrant, because Councillor Burgess mentioned it, another review by our lawyer? Are you comfortable with? I don't think she needs to have one. No. Are you okay with she's, that? She's been, oh. yeah. yeah. I just don't want it, the meter to keep running. I know, I hear you. It's, yeah. Yeah. it's been escalating and I'm yeah. concerned about how much money we've spent on this. Yeah. Just okay. So the, the yeah. other question Oops. I have then out of this is, would you like to add- Thank you, thank you, Mr. Gold. Wood, pal wood pellets or something to the acceptable burn materials. Um, commercially produced charcoal or briquettes. So, oh, with pallets in it. Yeah. Because they're commercially produced. Are, are right. we back to this uh, kind of cooker? Basically, yeah. Like fuel sources for fuel. Okay. But uh, just thinking, I'm not exactly sure what it is, but I'll give you an example. Uh, Canadian Tire sold a motorized scooter that was purchased by a bunch of pointer kids. And the OPP took them all off the road. So just because they sell it doesn't mean it's it's something that we have to accept mm -hmm. in our mm -hmm. like because my son was one of them and they said they're not allowed on the sidewalk or the road. It was three hundred dollars and then no, none of the kids could use them. So it I doesn't mean that because they sell it, yeah. it's something that you want. But we, wood pellets are used in smokers and we've permitted yeah. smokers. So I I think that first bullet could just say commercially produced charcoal briquettes or 
pellets or wood pellets because they don't burn so much they just create the the smoke right like the, the flavoring and that, like your comment about chemicals i mean I'm, these things are used for cooking food i wouldn't think they'd be putting chemicals in a wood pellet that's used for cooking food that's going to be harmful to people i, I wouldn't think i think there's a confusion with the word pellet versus pallet yeah so a pallet is a skid to yeah. move freight you were talking about pallets pallet. Pellets. You're talking about pellets. Oh, I think you, okay. were, I think you mentioned pellets. Yeah. So yeah. I went That's quite a different. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And I will, okay. I'll I add that yeah. to the, okay. the definition. Canadian Tire has them in the same category and they're at here or Home Depot or whatever, just not to. As a barbecue us. thing. It's a smoker and wood pellet. 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 Because when you said a person grills, when you said a pallet, Barbecue, I thought. No. I didn't no, get it. That would be hard to stop it from burning if you lit a fire in your <laughs> palate. Yeah, yeah. But I thought, okay, I'm not going to. It's our uh, proximity to Michigan. That? So we're going to add that to the definition of acceptable burn materials under that first line. Um, that Does that cover everything from your? Yeah, the only thing I wanted to just make sure we're clear on is. Um, we got the letter from the Lambda Public Health today, mm -hmm. and they talked about air. And I just wanted to reaffirm that we do have a paragraph in here that states that if a fire is affecting somebody's ability to enjoy their property, that that, that the fire can be extinguished. Right? Yes, it gives it gives discretion to the emergency services responders. Yeah. That if you know, because yeah, it does. Because I think every point in the Lambda Public Health letter referenced being able to close your windows, being able to run your air conditioner, being able to um, cool your home, et cetera. And I think that that paragraph covers that. Somebody could file, somebody could call complain that they're not able to sleep because they have to keep the windows closed, right? Because of the smoke, so, okay. okay. So to, start, to go through the bylaw, if you choose to pass it tonight, um, we're going to, we are going to, remove the word structure from the cooking app appliance definition. We're going to add wood pellets to the definition for um, acceptable, burn. acceptable burn materials. Thank you. We're going to have the safe location shall be a minimum of three meters vertically and horizontally. We are adding the definition of structure we are amending the definition of a recreational fire to add that the recreational fire must be fueled by an acceptable burn material. We're removing 4G, which says that um, the cooking fire must be used in a safe location. And the reason we're doing that is because as long as the cooking appliance is being used in compliance with manufacturer's guidelines, that allows that those devices to be used wherever the manufacturer says it's safe to do so. Um, we are removing 14 and that is it. Um, I did check, so I will be taking this in the fine structure of removing from number 11, this and section 4G. Okay. Um, and that's just so recreational fire is not held in a safe location. They're still not allowed in a like a recreational fire is not, but the cooking appliance doesn't apply here. So that's why 4G is coming out of there. Um, and then this here part I've, I've highlighted. And so we'll have to change that to three meters. Or you just put the word structure in the list, including trees, hedges, structure. Right. Controls. Okay. Yeah. Right. Works, yes. Because you know, it's all the same. And we will go through it with fine tooth comb again, just mm -hmm. to make sure that the fine numbers match up the way they're supposed to, and the the checklist matches with sections and such. But that's that's the changes that uh, that's the bylaw. In the in the checklist, though, you, we do have is the fire at least five five meters from any structure that needs to be changed. Right, exactly. So we're going to take the yeah. word structure and put it up here. Um, Adjacent property structures or objects, including trees, hedges, and shrubs, and that part that's highlighted in yellow will come out. 
we'll add the word structure in above. How does this affect me when I have one conflict? Um, I would say you the decision was made on that. You left the room. So okay. now we're applying we're so when I'm voting through, it's not, you're I okay. think you're fine. All right. No. So do we do, do a motion to accept the amendments or are we just gonna vote on the amended bylaw? I I would say just vote on the amended bylaw. Okay, I just want to make sure that was okay yeah. that we can vote. We've already moved it, right? Yeah, so I've moved the amendments. Or do we have a mover and a seconder, Jen? I only have um, second and second. Okay. So, second. Right. so I've moved the bylaw as amended. Yes. For yes. approval. Okay. And seconded by Councilor Nopter. Or did you not just do that? Or was no, I okay. just asked the question. Oh, right. Okay. Was, yeah. The motion was yeah. live. Is yeah. there any other questions? Okay. All in favor? Okay. Just a little bit. Did you guys have um, the amended stuff in that thing? It'll be easy on here, but yeah, don't come tomorrow. But, <laughs> but um, I, I don't mind going to student and putting on this wall and such things, and people can do that as well. And uh, you know, I, I will double check it along. Before yeah, just see, it's just it's just confusing because I, mm -hmm. I know. No, no, that's yeah. fine. I have no problem distributing. Them. Okay, you know, yeah. we told people that we would let them know what happened. Okay. So, and just a question to you. Are, are we going to make up a one pager at some point? We can. That was yeah, just, think, uh, sort of what London that. had. Yeah. So yeah, we absolutely. are looking to create just a, a one page highlights of the bylaw. An educational flyer. Yeah. To, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. yeah. And we'll make sure you get a copy of that when it's when it's done. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Nikki. Okay, last minute page. Eighteen point two. Yeah. Yeah which is this um, enforcement bylaw. So it gets into a lot of the stuff around repeat problems. So if a complaint is made about a neighbor's tree and we have the property standards officer go out and do an evaluation on the tree and she says it's not a problem and somebody calls back or somebody files a second complaint on the same tree. The same person. Recent, just, yeah. Or even, even a different person. Um, the, if it was a second person filed the complaint, we'd say that issue's already been dealt okay. with. And it yeah. had, but the the second, the same person filing the complaint a second time, we would basically just say, you know, we're not, we've already dealt with that issue. Yeah. We're not accepting the complaint. This is also what allows us to. So what I've talked about around this open burn bylaw the whole time is about, you know, when we get a complaint, when we get a call, when the fire department's dispatched. Now this bylaws in place, um, somebody's getting a letter. They respond to a call. Either the person making the call or the person you complained about is going to get a letter from you saying either you are in compliance with the fire, or and you know if it's the complainant, they're going to get a letter saying we investigated the fire was in compliance. The next time you make a complaint, you know, and I mean if it's three years down the road, we're not going to, but within reason, and that's determined by staff, what's reasonable, um, you will, you could potentially get fined or charged, if not fined, charged a fee for making a frivolous or vexatious complaint at, at multiple times. And what, what would you be charged? What would be fee for staff time, fee for? It would be according to the, the fees and structures bylaw. So it would be like for every truck that goes out, right. 400 bucks. But, an hour. but if I call about a tree, um, would it be it would, would be building for staff? Yeah, time yeah. That they're required to go out and yeah and respond. Yeah, is that would we capture that in the fees yep. for staff um, time? There's so that'll be that example would be a property standards issue, and that's okay. something that I it's one of the things on my list to look after okay. is is being able to charge back for property right. standards yes, issues. So yep. yeah, so it's a bit of a roundabout way of getting where we want to go. Mm -hmm. I guess it's not on the screen for you guys to look at either. There's no fee schedule on this file. No, but it refers back it refers to the fee back. schedule. Like, um, I'll 
I believe it's near the end of the bylaw. Right here. Number 28 of a complaint. If a complaint is determined to be frivolous or vexatious, the complainant may be subject to fees according to the village's fees and services by law. Do you want to put the number in there? I thought we weren't, weren't using numbers for a reason in the bylaw. Okay, well, I'll leave it right Yeah. Clarify, do we not refer to it? Did we not refer to it in the other We did in the fire bylaw. Um, yeah, I mean, it, what it says in the fire bylaw, I think it was bylaw 26 of 2022. 2022 I think it is. And it says, or its successor. So we, yeah. I can add that in. It, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's. And then I have a question, Marianne, mm -hmm. quickly is we use the term throughout this municipal um, standard. Mm -hmm. Is that, I'm not come across that in most of our documents. We normally refer to this municipal bylaw or whatever. Right. But so standard captures all that. I that's I think that's what it's meant to do is be a kind of a catch all phrase. A standard established by bylaw of council for the village of Point Edward or by provincial legislation for which the bylaw or legislation provides the contravention of the standard is an offense. So, so that's clear. Yeah. Here's my well, yeah. what it means <laughs> is that if there's a bylaw that says it's yeah. an offense to have a fire, yeah, then the that's standard the municipal is municipal standard. That becomes a standard. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just a new term I hadn't yeah. seen. No, it is. It's yeah. This is a fairly legal document. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm not, I'm not proposing any changes to this. And both of these are living documents, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if experience goes through and, you know, we need to make changes to a bylaw down the road, we can. So. We need a mover, right? Mm -hmm. okay. I'll move it. Councilor Murphy. Bylaw 25 of 2023 being a bylaw to establish transparent, consistent, fair, unbiased, and effective process for the enforcement and prosecution of alleged contraventions of municipal standards be read a first, second, and third time and passed on this day, June 27th, 2023. Seconded. Councilor Burgess, okay, all in favor? Thank you. Are we going to have it? We have nothing. Yeah. I can do the confirmation. Please. Uh, I'll move the bylaw number 26 of 2023 being a bylaw to confirm the resolutions of Point Edward Council, which were adopted up to and including June 27, 2023. Be uh, read a first, second, and third time and finally passed on this day, June 27, 2023. Second. All second. Councilor Mullins. All in favor? And then just motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Yeah, you do. First meeting, make the motion. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Seconded. Denied.